everyone. For the record, my name is Frank Baker, Boston City Councilor for District 3. I'm the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. I want to remind you that this is a public hearing and being recorded and broadcast live on Xfinity 8, RCN 82, and FIOS 964, and streamed on www.boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. Please silence your cell phones and other devices. Uh, we will also take public testimony and would appreciate it if you sign in over here. I think the people that want to testify in person uh, or to register your attendance. If you wish to testify via video conference, please email Megan, M-E-G-H-A-N dot Kavanaugh, K-A-V-A-N-A-G-H at boston.gov to sign up. When you are called, please state your name and affiliation or your residence and limit your comments to no more than two minutes to ensure that all comments are heard. That's for public testimony. Additionally, well, we are supposed to have Spanish translators in the chamber, so if somebody shows up, please make yourself be known. Uh, as well, I believe we have Arabic online. And if you need a translator via Zoom, please contact Megan Kavanaugh at boston.gov, which I just spelled out. You may also submit written testimony by emailing ccc.plandev at boston.gov. Okay, today's hearing is on docket number 0722. This is, a month, this is a matter sponsored by Council Coletta of District 1 and was referred to the Committee on Planning, Development and Transportation on June 8, 2020. Um, docket 0722 is an order for a hearing regarding a comprehensive district-wide planning process for Boston's waterfront. I'm joined by the Maker Council Coletta and the at-large council from Dorchester Council Murphy. Thank you guys for your, for your attendance. Um, and with that, I will turn it over for an open statement to Council Coletta, and we'll start this off. Testing, testing, okay, great. Um, thank you, Councilor Baker, for clearing your schedule and being here to chair this hearing. I'm, I'm very grateful that you could make this work after 5 p.m. Uh, and to central staff as well, thank you. Uh, I want to thank members of the administration who are here with us tonight. Uh, thank you to Chief of Planning, Arthur Jamison, for being here. Special thanks to Chief of Environment, Energy, and Open Space, Reverend Mariama White-Hammond. Um, it's always so great to see you both. And I just want to thank you for uh, your accessibility and being here after 5 p.m. so that the public could uh, listen in and participate. So I'm very grateful. I want to thank the advocates who are here with us from many uh, incredible organizations who work day in and day out to ensure our waterfront is resilient, inclusive, and accessible for all people. Uh, thank, uh, I want to thank the public, uh, those here and those watching at home for their participation as well. We received many comment letters, and I looked through some of them, and I look forward to reviewing all of them uh, in, the, in the subsequent days and weeks. And I look forward to dreaming big and listening and learning from you all what your vision for the waterfront is moving forward. Um, this, is, this was my first act in the City Council. I called for this hearing, and I did so with urgency in order to continue moving the needle towards a future that protects the resiliency of the city and its people. Sea level rise and storm surge due to climate change is a defining issue of our time. It seeks to displace millions globally, and according to the First Street Foundation, it threatens 45% of our critical infrastructure, including hospitals, airports, police and fire stations, and schools in Suffolk County alone. District 1 in particular faces unique pressure as Charlestown, East Boston, and the North End are all coastal communities. We face being hit first and worst by coastal flood flooding and already see it with every king tide and major storm that rolls through. East, Post, East Boston's population is particularly vulnerable as individuals who are a majority uh, low income and people of color based on census tract data are more likely to be displaced from flooding with assumptions at a nine inch increase by 2030, 21 inches by 2050, and 36 inches by 2070. Boston's waterfront is an incredible asset and an environmental treasure. We have a long maritime history that dates back to the founding of this great city, and our relationship has changed with the, with the harbor. And it needs to change in order to adequately protect ourselves, and we must look to the future. 
Cities across the world are actively planning to be able to meet the sea in a way that fortifies their coastline, takes in water on permeable spaces, and protects the built environment. Places like Rotterdam and Copenhagen are putting significant time, energy, and substantial investments into coastline infrastructure, as well as nature-based solutions to help mitigate the impending flood levels. As Boston prepares for sea level rise and storm surge, we must prioritize the same type of holistic waterfront planning that incorporates a strong framework for resilience and equity. So in terms of goals and framing for this hearing and why I produced this hearing order, I wanted to convene and start a public dialogue while exploring what a holistic approach to waterfront planning looks like here in Boston, specifically as it relates to my district and environmental justice communities like East Boston. I'm grateful, of course, to Mayor Wu and members of her administration for her focus on the new East Boston Municipal Harbor Plan, and I look forward to diving deeper into that um, through this conversation. I also look forward to discussing the recent uh, DPA letter that was sent to Secretary Card asking the state to lift industrial restrictions along East Boston's waterfront in order to obtain more resiliency. And as it stands right now, under the existing development review process, coastline resilience occurs on a parcel by parcel basis. We largely depend on private actors and their resources to accomplish protection from sea level rise and storm surge. It is a reality that we must work through, and we have an endless number of property owners, including Massport in the state, different industries, and varying land, varying land use designations. A, port, a point I want to underscore here is that I and many others believe the city has a role to play in leading this conversation, setting a framework to which others fall in line, while working with federal and state governments to identify public and private resources to fortify our waterfront. And I have to give credit to where credit is due. The city has already taken a, a leading role in identifying our most vulnerable areas along the waterfront and strategies to protect us. Two reports were recently completed under Climate Ready East Boston and Charlestown, and I believe we're going to get into that as well in the presentation. Um, and the city itself has demonstrated a commitment to climate resiliency by investing in its own property at Puppalo and Langoni Park in the North End, as well as Moakley Park in South Boston. These parks are shining examples of what is possible with adequate planning and the resources provided. So my goal is to better understand what comes next, how we are coordinating with the BPDA, pushing those who seek to build in our city to do better, while also setting Boston up for success to be a national leader in this space, much like our sister cities in Europe and even in Seattle. So in this space and in that spirit, I'm asking us to be bold, to think about where we are today and what we have to do to protect ourselves in the future. So I'm gonna pass it back to Chair Baker to start the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council Murphy, do you have an opening statement? Um, thank you, Chair. And um, I'm just happy to be here, and congratulations, Councilor Coletter. This was your maiden speech, and wanted to make sure I participated in this with you. Thank um, you. I, I've been born and raised in Dorchester, so I know firsthand growing up in one of the coastal neighborhoods in the city that if it's a high tide, um, a full moon, you can get blocked and not be able to get down Marcy Boulevard. It doesn't even have to be a big storm. And I know we have spoken um, sure. about our coastal waterfront where you know, we live on the water and there's lots of things we have to do, not just to protect it from climate, but also making sure that it's equitable and accessible to all of our residents, making sure that you know, the Boston Harbor Islands and the ocean and all of the wonderful resources we have living along the water are, you know, everyone can enjoy those. So looking forward to this conversation and advocating to make sure that we, we save our coastal neighborhoods and that we listen. It's great to see. Um, so thank you to everyone who showed up after work today. It's great to see the advocates and the experts who are already advocating and know a lot to share with us, the council, so we can make good decisions. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Murphy. And I'd just like to, to um, recognize John Rogers, state rep from Norwood. John from Norwood is here joining us tonight. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys. If you could introduce yourself, we know who you are, but people at home potentially don't. So who you are, what your title is, and, and you guys can get right into your presentation. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Reverend Mariama White Hammond. I am the Chief of Environment, Energy, and Open Space. Good evening. My name is Arthur Jemison. I am the Chief of Planning and the Director of the Boston Planning and Development Agency. So I'm going to start by sharing a few slides just so we have a common understanding of sort of what we're facing. 
Um, we're thankful to have this opportunity. I know that um, many of you have been part of some of these climate ready um, processes, uh, but just want to make sure that we have sort of that, that common edge, um, understanding to start from. Let's see. Hmm. It seemed like it registered it, right? Oh wait, it did something. Oh, there we go. There we go. All right. Um, so just to, to be clear, um, we at the Environment Department are looking at four major impacts of climate change. Heat, which uh, we released a report this year, and is the most significant and most deadly impact of climate change. We'll not spend a significant amount of time talking about this, but I do want to raise it. Because when we look at solutions, we are looking at as many solutions as possible that address all four of these issues, not just one. Uh, extreme pre pre precipitation, um, sea level rise, and coastal storms. So uh, I think many of us lived through the reality of Boston in 2018. And you can see here in the top left corner, flooding in the north end, to the top right, flooding in East Boston, down in the bottom right, flooding in Charlestown Navy Yard, and to the bottom left, flooding in Long Wharf in downtown. And so as Councilor Coletta had said, um, this is the district that has the sort of largest collection of neighborhoods that all are experiencing significant flooding. Now it's worth noting, Council Baker, I know we live down the street from each other. We also do have some flooding challenges. Um, I thought we were going to see the Savin Hill picture in there with the pot. I, I know, I know, but you know, I, next I, time. I, <laughs> next time. We've got a little bit of Dorchester in here. Um, and so, really, we're here to talk about coastal flooding um, and want to make sure that folks recognize this is, and I'm, I don't know if, it, if people can see, but this is what we are expecting with the risk of nine inches of sea level rise, which we expect to be coming as early as 2030. And so we do not have a significant amount of time. Um, for those of you who've ever built anything, just one building can take quite a while to move through permitting, through thinking, um, much less the level of projects that we're talking about to close these major um, flood pathways. This is what East Boston looks like with 40 inches of sea level rise, which is the new projection from UMass by 2070. This is what Charlestown looks like by 2030 and by 2070. And then the north end and downtown, you can see both near term and long term on the same slide. And since it's my own neighborhood, I thought I would throw in Dorchester. I couldn't quite get a little pin so you can see my house, which is right along the floodplain as water comes down Columbia Road, um, that challenging rotary right near Moakley Park um, will be its own river, um, and it will bring water to my home. And so this is not just something I work on as my job, but something I think about as uh, a responsibility to my own neighbors who are right there in the pathway. Um, this is South Boston. We weren't going into it as much, but as you can see, um, particularly the seaport, but a lot of South Boston is at really high flood risk, um, both in the near term and long term. So we have done a series of different planning efforts. Um, going back, our first was released in um, the Climate Ready Boston first summary, I believe was released in 2015, and then we went through each neighborhood really digging into what are the specific pathways? When are we going to be impacted? And most importantly, what do we need to do about it? So we've done a neighborhood level coastal resilience planning, um, which means really working with a combination of residents and technical experts to
to get a clear picture of where the flooding is coming and what we need to do to address it. As was mentioned, our first report was about East Boston and Charlestown, and our final report finished up um, the second layer for East Boston and, China, and Charlestown. These, the second report is about the things that we are dealing with in the longer term. The first report really dealt with those early pathways um, that are in immediate danger. And so this gives you a sense of phase one for East Boston and Charlestown. And in some instances, we've already gotten some of these things done. So if people are looking at some of the processes that we've done in terms of Ryan Playground and thinking about how that space can be part of resilience, um, there are some things that we have looked at in East Boston um, to support resilience. But the reality is that for all of the planning we've done, the real focus now is on implementation. And the urgency, obviously, as you can see from the pictures, is that we don't have a lot of time. Seven years before um, 2030 uh, does not give us a lot, a lot of time to really begin to get shovels in the ground and deal with these issues. So I wanted to note that we have done some things. Um, as was mentioned, this is Lingoli Popolo up um, in the top right corner. And further down, the East Boston Resilient Waterfront pro Project um, that was, the design was completed in 2022. Um, it has not yet gone to construction, but we have been moving along some of these plans. Um, and then this is the Ryan Playground vision. Um, I'm, I'm sure some folks have participated in that process. And the Moakley Park vision, which I literally carry in my um, backpack or purse wherever I go. It's been to Glasgow, it's been to Tanzania as I want to talk to people about the fact that we really need to start putting shovels in the ground. So I'm very thankful for this hearing, um, and you'll have an opportunity to hear more about how we're leaning to that um, as we, I pass it over to um, Chief Jemison to, to share his view. Sure, well thanks, good evening. Um, there's a slide that, um, if you could help me bring up, it's I think the first one that was up there before. I'll use that to, uh, to uh, speak to at the end. Um, good evening, um, Councilor Baker. Good evening, uh, Councilor Coletta. Thank you very much for holding this hearing tonight. Uh, I'm Arthur Jemison, your Chief of Planning and uh, Director of the BPDA. Um, just a few comments for the record. Um, Mayor asked me to take this role to realign the city's planning and development work to tackle the city's greatest challenges. Uh, resiliency, affordability, and equity are the three uh, that we've been focused on. Um, Boston's waterfront is a place where these three priorities intersect and are of paramount importance to us. Uh, tomorrow marks four months on the job here, and in those four months I've invested time and energy into understanding the current landscape and envisioning um, the opportunities we have ahead, many of which uh, my colleague has identified in the, uh, in the presentation she showed. Um, I'm returning to Boston after working uh, for almost two years in the, um, at, at HUD, uh, in my role as the Acting Assistant Secretary for Community Planning and Development, among other things, we allocated the $80 billion that uh, are going to American communities who are recovering from disasters. Um, community development block grant funds are a key part of the resource array that communities use to recover from disasters. Um, almost all of those disasters um, had a direct relationship with climate change. Um, and just to give a sense of um, dimension, $80 billion is not only the amount of money that my one section of the agency had to help um, communities recovering from disaster, $80 billion is also the approximate annual budget of the entire agency. To give you a sense of just how urgent this crisis is around the country. Um, where resiliency measures are not taken, uh, the price you pay can be very high. Um, and rebuilding after disasters is much more expensive, yep. uh, messier uh, than taking preventative measures. Uh, the good news is that uh, I can assure you that in my capacity as chief of planning, the, the waterfront's capacity to help us prevent these disasters is going to be a, a, a major priority. <clears throat> so over the last four months, uh, I've had the chance to walk the waterfront with advocates, stakeholders, uh, and planning development experts at BPDA, and I've really been impressed with the energy expertise and knowledge in our city, uh, both in our department, um, in the uh, community, among advocates, and other places. Um, 
we're far ahead in our understanding of the thinking, particularly the, uh, compared to other places in the country that I've had a chance to visit uh, in my uh, prior capacity. Um, the work that's been done so far is, is leading and groundbreaking, and now we have the chance to turn it into action. Uh, this is the place where we need to ramp up our efforts together, implementation, as my colleague shared. We can't approach this effort the way we approach our smaller mitigation projects. Um, one of the things I've had a chance to see is some of the excellent uh, and brilliant individual responses to individual development projects um, issues with resilience. Um, but what's needed is a much grander and larger uh, attack on this issue. Um, it's an effort that's going to take coordination between city, state, and federal officials, and honestly, it's going to take it's going to take billions of dollars. The same way that Harbor Cleanup um, uh, took that kind of resource. Um, and I know that I have the I've got such confidence in our, our counselor colleagues, our representatives at the state, and our representatives from Massachusetts to the federal level uh, that that we can resource those dollars together. Um, but I, one thing I do want to talk about: it's going to take all of us saying to ourselves. Some of us are focused on programming waterfronts. Others of us are focused on seawalls and infrastructure. The, the most imminent threat to a, all of us is the absence of the dollars uh, in a coordination uh, required to actually implement the, the changes. That's the biggest threat we have. Um, and I know I've heard many strong feelings uh, on many topics in many specific places uh, on our waterfront, especially the places that each of you represent. Um, and I also know Bostonians were spirited people. Um, and they're strong advocates. Um, but without the resource array present, you know, our debate about whether a dollar goes to bring people to the waterfront or a dollar goes to capitalize new sidewalks, we need far more resource than is currently in the system. Uh, the good news is that um, this is a, our, our city has, strong, uh, has a strong revenue base. It has a AAA credit rating. Um, and this unprecedented state and federal dollars available uh, to attack these efforts. So um, I want to thank, you again, thank you again for convening us, because this is the kind of convening that it, I think begins to get the story out about the resource array we need. So what we're going to be doing as part of the group of uh, organizations that are going to be working on behalf of the city to, uh, to implement change is you're going to be seeing us taking steps to um, develop local climate resilience plans you know, all over the city, uh, create flood protection systems that provide multiple benefits, uh, apply new sustainable models for the creation and maintenance of uh, public waterfront areas, deploy proactive zoning, and create uh, predictable entitlement processes for greater public benefit. Uh, as you all know, and I think in the examples you've used, um, we're relying on developers and private interests to protect um, their project and maybe a little bit more. And that, that's a strategy that's worked for us historically. But if we're going to be prepared for what's coming, we need more resources. Uh, we're going to create new open spaces as part of this. Um, we'll talk about this later. We're going to address DPAs where they're not serving community interests so they can be adapted for resilience measures. And we're going to strengthen and expand our waterfront housing and job centers. Um, most important thing I want to stress is that our efforts are intentional about protecting low-income and working families who are most vulnerable to these threats. Efforts are specifically intended to prevent displacement and instead create new opportunities for affordable housing, local jobs, green community spaces. I uh, can't stress that point enough. Um, so the slides I wanna, slide I want to close with is the Resilient Boston Harbor Report that envisions a green and accessible waterfront, protecting Boston from coastal storms while increasing accessible waterfront open space. Um, you can see it here. It shows you some of the uh, projects that uh, the chief um, recommended. The community informed this process by pressing the city to think boldly about how our waterfront adapts, uh, not with gray, hard infrastructure, but with true open space networks. The city and the BPA can turn these risks into design opportunities. Uh, could these improvements that are proposed here uh, not just protect the city, but create the kind of uh, waterfront that uh, reminds us of our Olmstead parks around the city? We'd like to think that we can rise to this challenge. Uh, it's an example of how the community is going to drive and will continue to inform our decision making uh, as we adapt and grow. Looking forward to working with the city council, uh, the mayor, and the rest of the cabinet, our state and federal partners to capitalize on the moment we're in um, to address resiliency, affordability, and equity. Um, just to, in closing, I, I would also add that as we've uh, begun to work together, we've begun to identify places and ways that BPDA's unique 
uh, role uh, in, in its work in the city can bring specific uh, assets, powers, and value to, um, to the work that needs to be done. Uh, when we're done with this, we're going to find that the Army Corps of Engineers, FEMA, uh, the city, the state, um, and, the, and various city uh, agencies with implementation capacity from uh, the DPW to uh, BPDA directly through um, the DPDA's work with um, organizations that um, do mitigation um, as part of their development projects. All of those things are going to need to work in tandem to create the waterfront that not, doesn't just um, look great and, and be, become a, a center of, of the city the way it already is, but protect us from uh, the worst effects of climate change. Thanks again for your time and attention. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I just need to make a couple announcements that we do have our, our Spanish interpreter, if anybody needs it, you can make yourself known. Um, we have, give me a second here, we have our Chinese interpreter and our uh, Arabic interpreter on Zoom. If anybody needs help, it's, it's Ethan, E-T-H-A-N dot Vera, V-A-R-A three at boston.gov if you need help with interpretation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chief, uh, Ch Chief and Chief for your comments. Um, I think we'll have a, a couple questions for you guys if that's okay. Um, and then we'll get into the advocate panels. If you guys are able to hang around a little bit for a while, that would be, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Arthur, you had talked about absence of dollars and, and coordination. So that's, that to me sounds, so we need to be hyper-focused on the developments that are happening on where we can um, deliver resilience, resiliency solutions. So how is that, how is that happening? It, it, like how many people do you have that are working on, so if a project comes in mm -hmm. and you have your transportation needs, these two people are doing that, you have your, um, you know, whatever the needs are. So who and how many people are specifically dealing with this one in terms of planning under, under, your, under your roof in your shop when a, a large development or even a small on the water development happens? And, and how, are we, how are we as a city, um, because dealing with developments that I have that's mm -hmm. multi-pronged and agencies all over the place, how do we keep all that corralled and how are you, how are you doing that in, in, your, in the BPDA in your role? Um, thank you very much, Councilor. So I, I think I have approximately six um, full-time staff members in the planning uh, section who work on climate change matters. Um, and so their work goes from the full gamut from producing plans um, that are proactive about uh, what needs to be protected, writing the grant applications that bring new capital in, to reviewing projects like uh, Dorchester Bay City or others that have resilience components. Uh, to make sure that the recommendations that have come from the developers are uh, consistent with segments of the planning that's already been done. Um, so, for example, when um, it, there's elements of um, Dorchester Bay City or other projects that have proposed to implement resilient solutions, uh, or even in Charlestown where we have um, you know, the Flatley Company proposing to do uh, implement resilience uh, solutions as part of their developments, we've got five or six people. We're looking at that, uh, reviewing it, sending um, comments to the uh, developer and in the negotiation about mitigation. So, so if we were to systematically go along the waterfront starting from point A to mm -hmm. wherever we end up, it, it would be privately owned, state owned, maybe a city. So privately owned would be, we would expect the developer to work with us and then so dollars that would be so and how are we coordinating state city and and what would those dollars look like are we able to sort of um, cast a wider net with the development that's happening and in is there are there specific funds available because i mean when you look at the amount of mm -hmm. work that's going to need to happen just in in district one that looks like a billion dollars to me or, or more over and above the private investment. So we, how do we envision that coming together? Sure. So um, what you might do for uh, a neighborhood is say, you know, here's all the points of inundation that we're aware of, and here's the, uh, the way that the um, 
here's, here's the way that the waterfront is divided among public, private, uh, and nonprofit actors. And then you say, okay, well, um, if we need to protect this area of inundation, um, this part's where the public can act. Uh, we can ask property owners to take care of their own property. Um, and then we can, you know, um, there's other things we can do. Uh, I will tell you that this is where, um, and one of the reasons why uh, this is such a challenging topic, is um, not every owner is ready to today um, do a development project. Uh, not every owner today has the resources to protect their portion of the waterfront um, from inundation. So there may be moments, and, and this is where there's discussion that has to happen, how do we protect a waterfront that isn't entirely owned by the public? Mm. Um, how, what are the public, uh, where is the public right of way, so to speak, um, that allows us to protect the entire area? Um, because again, some places we'll get it from the public private sector, some places we're gonna need to think about how we um, either use existing public right of way or expand the public right of way so that we are able to protect that region, because again, when the, <clears throat> when the storms hit, um, you know, people aren't thinking about property lines as much. Yeah. So I think this slide might give you a sense. Um, it gives you, this is um, along the waterfront downtown. It's my understanding, I think there are 16 different property owners that we would need to work in concert to address all of the flood points that we're looking at. And so, there is the challenge of, do you open 16 different con con Well, up until now, I think, to Chief Jemison's point, we just waited for a development to happen, mm -hmm. and then we open the conversation. But, but sometimes if you wait, they, that development may not be at the most major flood point. If they do that and the person next to them doesn't do anything, what they're doing could be for not, right? Um, and so there is a tension between strategies along the waterfront that we require everyone to work in concert, or do we do strategies in the public way where we control it, but it does mean we will protect everyone behind, but we will leave everybody on the other side exposed. Mm -hmm. And we have multiple instances where we have already had conversations and you have two people that are saying, oh my gosh, this is serious, we need to address it. One person who says, I'll take my chances. Another person who says, let's put up a harbor barrier. And so there's a challenge because people have different levels of recognition about the threat. People have different abilities financially to act. Um, and people have different levels of risk. If you just have a warehouse, you may not exactly care <laughs> about the flooding quite as much as if that's where you live. Um, I think I mentioned the, the harbor barrier, so I might also note, if we're, we don't have enough money, but if we're going to raise resources, we have to look at solutions that address multiple challenges. And there have been many things mentioned, the harbor barrier is an example. A harbor barrier could help with storms, but it would do nothing for sea level rise, nothing for heat or rainwater flooding. Um, can, you, can you expound on, on harbor barrier, what you mean? Like, are you talking right. about actual gates? Are we talking of <clears throat> uh, material just berm or when, right. when, you, when so, you say um, that? And whereabouts in yes. the harbor are you talking there, about? There has been a proposal out there, and I've just, you know, I've heard it in community meetings, so I think it's worth mentioning. The idea that we would put something closer to the mouth of the harbor, sort of a little further out, um, that is true during storms would could help us reduce winds or could help us reduce some of, storm, of the storm surge. We could close it, sort of keep some of that storm surge back. But um, you have real questions about, do we still want the harbor to be a navigable channel? Because if you do, then you'd have to leave that open most of the time, and then it would do nothing for us on sea level rise. Yeah. Um, so I think that there are, from my perspective, and I think you know, most of you know that I'm a reverend, but there is a necessity for our city to collectively come to some recognition about the existential threat that we're in. Mm -hmm. I think this is a real opportunity. Because if we can face it and we can face it together, then we could rise to the occasion and make choices together. 
But we are not yet at that point. And I understand how hard it is for people to face a place that they have invested their life in, that they often purchased or grew up in before we even knew climate change was an issue. But it is challenging when people are at varying levels of acceptance. I see people going through the process of denial and grief while we're in these meetings. Because these are not just slides. These are real places that people live and love. And um, what we are saying is we can't go parcel by parcel waiting for each person to get it. When 2030 is just around the corner. It has to be more comprehensive. And I would say, you know, we, we have jobs to, to work on this. But we actually just as much need the help of the council and other folks. How do we get folks to have a shared understanding of what we're facing and then embrace some shared solutions that will, call, that will require sacrifice by all of us? Mm. Um, and in addition to the implementation dollars that we definitely need, we cannot use them parcel by parcel. That will not work to address the threat we're facing. And I don't think we as a city are there on a heart level and ready to lean into those decisions as things are currently. Thank you. Um, you, you had mentioned a number of parcels that were kind of identified. Was it 24 or how many? So I think it's along, this was downtown. I believe yeah. it's downtown at 16. I can't remember, like on Border Street in, in East Boston. Yeah. Like so if you, have it, if you have it sectioned out, here's downtown, you have yeah. X amount there. <coughs> right. and, it's, and, and, and those are the property owners. One might be ready to go. One might just have the warehouse, he's in his 80s, he knows he's right. gonna die. So oh, my son will take it. You know what I mean, like the people just can be in different places. Yeah, so <laughs> discussions with everybody. Right, and, and so I think I just wanna be real. If we know that it's coming, do we take the strategy of trying to get the alignment of 16 people? Or do we take, just take the strategy of building behind them to protect the tens of thousands of people mm. who will be impacted if they can't all get into alignment? Okay, Councilor Coletta, do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Go for it. Thank you both so much. I've been taking, I mean, you should see my notepad here, just the ideas that you're pushing out and um, things that I'm feeling, you're talking about at heart level. I look at these maps and homes of my family and friends are in them. I have a visceral reaction to it. It is deeply personal to me, and as I know it is to you, Reverend, as well. And so that is why I'm bringing this urgency to this space. Um, and I'm happy also to hear, Chief Jamison, that you're talking about the significant investment that we're gonna need. I think you mentioned the cleanup of the Boston Harbor. I think that this is big dig level, and I think we need to start getting people to that point and understanding that we need infrastructure dollars to cover this and to do this. And like you said, we need a uh, a collective approach and we need people to come together and fully understand the the gravity of, of all of this so I just appreciate you bringing that up as well um, from what I heard from the both of you it really is it's two separate buckets uh, it's planning and then implementation right and we've gone through the planning exercises um, I have all of these plans in my district phase one phase two north end downtown which is 2020 and then um, and then Charlestown so and then for me, for implementation, I do see the barriers of implementation being these, these, this money that we need, these dollars. Um, but before I get to that, in terms of the, the planning aspect of it, um, because we want to move from a parcel by parcel basis, you know, for me, I, I see these plans and I think of them as a puzzle piece. Right? How are we? How are they interlocking with the strategies that are proposed in them to fully protect and fortify our coastline? And so um, that's something that I think for everyone at home, you know, I've, I've reviewed them myself, but for folks not in the details, are they talking to one another? Are we able to fully protect our coastline um, with what is proposed in these plans? So I know that there's elevated harbor walks, right? And there's, um, I don't know, flood barriers, right? So my first question, just to tee up the next couple of questions is, do these plans talk to one another? Yes, um, we have. Uh, done each of these plans with 
thinking about how they relate to each other. Mm -hmm. It is also true that some of these flood pathways are not exactly connected. So there are some places, actually there are some communities, South Boston being one, um, there's some places in, in Roxbury in the South End mm -hmm. where people are actually vulnerable to multiple flood path pathways. Uh, there's parts of Eastie that are vulnerable to both flood pathways. Um, so yes, we have looked at them, um, but you know, there's 47 miles of coastline, so if you live at mile three, you might not be affected by what happens at mile 11, but we have, wherever there's sort of contiguous coastline, we have been looking at each of those pathways, especially if they uh, end up running into each other. And, that, and you know, we could talk about that at some other point, but there are some communities that are not even at the coastline, they're mm -hmm. further back, but they, because of their, you know, sort of lower elevation, they would see two pathways coming into them if we don't close them both off. Okay. And then how do they, so Climate Ready, um, East Boston Phase 1 and Phase 2, and Charlestown Phase 1 and Phase 2, mm -hmm. as you know, Chief, we have Plan Eastie and Plan Charlestown currently mm -hmm. underway. Um, how do these plans align with, with one another, and how are they talking to one another? And if a developer were to come to you today with a new proposal, or any existing proposal in the pipeline, what is, what is being asked of them? What are we pointing them to? How are we telling them to plan for the future on behalf of the city? Uh, we're telling them to look to the plans that, because uh, again, the, the plan that um, Chief White Hammond is describing is a plan that uh, all of our planners, the five or six people I mentioned, and, and environment have worked on jointly. So we're saying, listen, are you, what are you going to contribute to the protection of the, of the, um, of the waterfront uh, based on what's in this plan and what your project proposes to do? Um, you know, I think, I, since I know this is a subject that you wanted to uh, get into a little bit, um, you know, with the lifting of the, the request to lift the DPA, um, what you're seeing there is, you know, if you walk along Border Street, um, you can see that there's some developments where there's sites where there's been a development and there's mm -hmm. others where there's no development or there's vacant um, industrial buildings. And so people lifting the DPA means that those people who own those properties might see more value in those properties and say, let me take an action. But the, the way that our plan East Boston uh, effort is going to work is there's going to be a coordinated discussion and say, well, this, the value has been created, but for you to realize it, you're going to have to not just protect the, the city mm -hmm. with some of the new value you may be realizing through um, infrastructure. You're also going to need to protect, help us protect affordability uh, for people who uh, may live behind you who will be affected by um, you, the development. So we're acting in concert um, and connecting the, the sort of public sides of the plans with the development um, sides of the plans as well and, and directing developers to the same resource. Gotcha. And thank you for bringing up the, the DPA. I do, mm -hmm. Chair, if I could ask one question on that yeah. and then we'll get into Good implementation. Problem. Thank you. Um, so as you mentioned, um, Mayor Wu uh, submitted a letter to Secretary Card uh, asking to lift the, the DPA along, the mm -hmm. East, uh, along East Boston's waterfront. Um, she pledged to create a community resilience zone along the water's edge. And Mariama, you also mentioned um, just a set of uh, mechanisms and tools mm -hmm. that the city was going to start to develop. I think you had mentioned protective zoning and incentivizing um, community um, community mitigation in a certain way. Could you talk about those tools and mechanisms? Do you already have a list of that or an understanding of what they might look like? Sure. So when you, uh, again, you walk, go back to Border Street again, um, and you see different conditions on different properties. So there might be a person there who owns a warehouse uh, who has said, well, you know, I'm in the DPA. Uh, let me see if I can get some maritime tenants. Maybe my maritime tenant um, List isn't very long. Uh, can you sort of sure. break in? Can you explain DPA to people? Sure. Don't? Sorry, pardon me. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, for all those listening, the designated port area uh, is what DPA stands for. And it's a designation uh, administered by uh, the, the Office of Coastal Zone Management, um, which I believe is part of DEP here at the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, what they do is they um, regulate the use of um, shoreline. And um, if you have a designated port area, what it means is that you're only able to use that for maritime uses. So if you want to uh, fix or improve boats, if you want to do other things that are uh, connect you to the, to the sea. Could it be a fish processing? It, yes. That's yes. So, so maritime industry. Yes. So um, there are parts of the coastline where there's, 
very active maritime industry and there's parts where the, it, it's not active anymore. Um, and so some, many places uh, on the East Boston waterfront have, uh, there's not activity anymore. So, but your property that you might be the owner of is limited by the DPA, designated port area requirements, to a limited number of uses. So if there's no market for lobster men or other things that, who might, people who might use that space, you're, 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 kind of, you're saying to yourself, well, I can't really get value out of my property. So many of those owners uh, have said to us, well, we'd love to get the DPA lifted so that we can realize a waterfront development. Yeah. You could do residential or any sort of commercial when the DPA is lifted. Is lifted. And so... Thank you for clarifying No, no problem. Us. I'm sorry, I can keep going a little bit on what happens next. Yeah. I think it goes to the, the counselor's question. <clears throat> so when that DPA is lifted, there's a very significant increase in value. Um, a property that might be a warehouse um, that doesn't have a lot of use right now could be turned into very valuable residential or, or other uses. Um, so that owner might say, well, hey, I've, my, my ship has come in, so to speak, and I'm going to, That's a word. I'm going to build, I'm sorry. Good job, Martha. We like that. Work. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping it light at sorry. 7 p.m. Moments of levity, uh, <laughs> even here in the council chamber. So um, <clears throat> anyway, they might say, I have, I have an opportunity to realize really significant value, and so let me go sell my property. I think what we're, what we're going to do is, when we lift that, we're also going to impose zoning or other requirements that suggest if you try to use another, do another use, you have a very detailed and extensive requirement to build um, infrastructure along the side of your, uh, on the waterfront that will protect that portion of the, of the waterfront from inundation. Um, and that's, so that's one flank. And the other flank will have zoning requirements, or maybe even others, would be to say, um, well, you may be developing a very fancy development, um, and that might be okay, but what about the residential behind you? How are we going to protect and preserve the existing, um, uh, the existing um, fabric back there uh, that's owned by a wide range of people and occupied by people with a wide range of incomes? How do we keep those folks uh, there so they have the benefit of the protection and any of the other changes that might happen? So, those are the two kinds of ch things we're talking about. It could be money, it could be zoning, it could be a combination of both um, that are requested of the developer. Because you could have a virtuous cycle where you get, um, you get infrastructure that protects the city, you get development that helps the city's income, and you protect people with uh, low and moderate income, people who are in the same neighborhood. We believe that it's possible to achieve that with, through the lifting of the DPA in specific locations. That's great. I love the idea of tying affordability, you know, with some of these investments too, because we talk about G green gentrification, right? And what I've heard a solution to that is ensuring that we're building parks, but at the same time we have to build affordable housing, yeah. right? Tying them together, making sure that that unintended consequences isn't actually taking place. So I appreciate hearing that, and, and thank you for that. Okay. Um, my last question, I think, with implementation, is um, just this barrier to to the dollars and how, how big of an investment this is going to be, right? The city could potentially give some money, the state could give some money to this. Um, I bring this up all the time, but it used to be the Build Back Better uh, federal. It's, it's now the Inflation Reduction Act, I think. Right. Did I get that right? Okay, good. Um, it has a coastline resiliency line item. And so my question is, is how does the city go after that money? How are we competitive? Are we being competitive for that? And how does that trickle down to the city? Well, I hope I'm not getting up in front of myself. Look, we're excited that uh, next week we have someone who will be coming back, and I'm sure there's going to be some other bigger announcement, so I'll just keep it, but whose core function will be to pull us together on infrastructure planning. Um, I think we, multiple agencies, including both of our own and others, um, in seeing um, the Inflation Protection Act, felt like there were a lot of opportunities in there. Mm -hmm. um, and we would need to have some coordinated efforts to really think about our infrastructure and figure out how we access those dollars. We've got all of th these plans that we've talked about. We've got the Long Island Bridge. We've got a lot of things that um, have gotten a little bit backlogged. And the question is, how do we put Boston's um, foot first um, and really being able to access these dollars. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited. I won't make any announcements, but I think we'll all be 
I know I'm excited to work with this person, and I think a lot of folks will awesome. be looking forward. Can to I ask a, ask a quick quick? So yes. that person will um, go after go after the the infrastructure dollars, but also have the un understanding and be in the rooms where the the infrastructure is is being yes. planned across yes. the city. Um, so have an understanding of big infrastructure projects, and then the ability to go after them at a federal level. Yes. Great. Nice. That's great. Um, I would love to see a designated waterfront person, but I, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> I've put that out there many, many times, but um, because this is <clears> going to be such a large endeavor, I really would love somebody uh, who is focusing on this mm -hmm. separate from um, the BBDA, potentially their own sort of cabinet or department. So I'll, I'll again put that on record, and I know that no one can really speak to that quite yet. So what I'll do is just leave um, a suggestion out there. We talked about pulling everybody together, the mm -hmm. 16 different actors. Um, have we considered doing a waterfront bid to try to get folks to the table? So I think um, that has actually been on the list of things that we're considering. Um, so I think it's worth noting, a lot of the folks that we're talking about participated in some way in the climate ready conversation. Uh, and now we need to have that same level of engagement on the implementation side. And the question is how do we um, do that? So we've actually tossed out a few different kinds of ideas. Um, a bid is one, uh, but also like something like the Wharf District Council. What like what are what is the right model? And I think in particular, I, I want to know: um, Are more affluent communities already have such groups? Mm -hmm. Where we have a real challenge is some of our communities, um, where they don't happen to have an architect living in the building, and there's not you know. Oh yeah, we have a n n landscape architect, and we have a you know like, oh this person is the so and so at DOT. That's great. Not knocking it. We're, we're trying to also figure out how do we level the playing field a little bit so that um, some of our communities that are less sort of resourced and credentialed in this particular field can sit at the table um, with just as much ability to participate in decision making. Um, and lead the process. So I think there's a few different models that we've been looking at. Um, our teams have had multiple conversations about like how do we, how do we get this moving? How do we, do we put everybody in a room for like six days and be like come back with the plan? You know, so what are, what are the different ways we approach it? Um, but I think what I can say is there's a clear shared sense of urgency and an alignment of what we need to do. Um, and so now we need to just sort of line up with the mechanism that starts to Put all the ideas on the table, figure out the pros and cons of them, and then figure out how we begin to start walking that path. Okay. I was just going to add one thing that I think is um, kind of a dimension of this is, you know, while um, there are things where, where, that, where the city is probably going to need to act um, with private owners alone, and there's places where we'll act together with the state, and there's places where the federal feds and state and city will act together just because there are the urgency of this is such that there may be sort of the time to coordinate. I do know that, you know, prior uh, leadership of the city had worked really hard and thoughtfully to bring the state together because the state had sort of a little bit more ownership of some things than we did. But at some point, we all have to kind of just get started. And uh, I think that's one of the challenges is both being coordinated, but also having the ability to act and self act and self help when necessary, so it's going to be it's going to be fun, and I think we'll. Uh, fun is probably not the right word to use, but <laughs> it'll be fun. Working on it's going to be fun because we'll all be working together on a common cause, and I think and, that's and what I. We've done it on some of our own pieces of land. Um, those, you know, we've, and we, had, we've done it with Langoli Papalo, and we're talking about it. Anyway. And the BPDA has begun that work on its own land at the Raymond L. Flynn um, um, Marine Industrial Park. We are we are undertaking some of this work on our own. So um, everyone's got to do their part and we're going to, we're starting. Thank you. You both have been generous with your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just one quick, one quick question. And I want to just, I have to read something here, but so when we talked about the sections of, you know, downtown, however many parcels, do we have like individually in those parcels, this is what we'd like to see here, or is or we, we need to wait for something to move, whether it's development or or um, if it's a city-owned land. Like, do we know exactly what we want in those places, parcel by parcel, or is that uh, like you just kind of know 
if it's raise it up or, or what the, the fix would be there? Like how detailed is, is that? So often we're looking at an integrated approach. So for instance, in Charlestown, an elevated harbor walk that would go across multiple yeah. properties. Um, so yes, it, it requires, different people would have different contributions that they would need to make in terms of sometimes right away. So an example, like we knew we wanted to put a berm in the seaport. So because most of those were new buildings, they were sort of saying to people, like, okay, yeah, you own this parcel, but we need you to leave this amount for the right of way because the berm is gonna go in here and if you build on it, we can't put the berm there. Yeah. So I think sometimes, even if we're not able to tell people you need to do X, we can say things like, well, don't build up to here or leave this space open for the future plan that we have coming. Um, but it, it depends. It depends on the flood pathway. In many instances, we're talking about something, an intervention that needs to go across multiple things, and people may still need to raise the elevation of their buildings and, and not put electricity. So um, you can see the difference between what the environment parks and BPA were thinking 10 years ago and where we are now and sort of what kinds of, how there's been an evolution of those requirements as the data has gotten clearer, mm -hmm. as our understanding what we need to do has gotten clearer. Um, but yeah, the, in many cases there are there is a pretty concrete project, yeah. sometimes connected, sometimes sort of a little bit more spot addressing a particular place. Okay, and before I go to Council Murphy, I just want to read this letter from, from Council Flynn. Dear Council Baker and Council Coletta, please be advised I'm unable to attend today's hearing on docket 0722 in order for a hearing regarding a comp comprehensive district-wide planning process for Boston's waterfront. I will review the tape of the hearing when it becomes available. Thank you for your leadership on this matter. Sincerely, Ed Flynn, Boston City Council District 2. Uh, Council Murphy, do you have some questions? Um. Just one, and it may, I think it will come up when the community speaks, but is there fair, when I looked at that slide that showed the integrated resilience strategies, and there's the one that doesn't exclude anyone, goes right mm -hmm. to the edge, and then the public right of way, mm -hmm. is there fair that there will be owners or you know private entities along the water that may just, I know we talked about some different types of you know, maybe it's a warehouse, maybe they don't have the money, but is there fear that people might hold out thinking, well, why should I pay up front if we think the city will just go to the edge anyway? I, I don't know if I can project what people right. are thinking. I think, um, I guess where, where it's challenged is if one or two people hold out sometimes it negates most of the work of everyone else. Right, yeah. And so then the question is, what is the fair and just thing to do? Do we say we will yeah. and that's disregard everybody point. else's right. contribution? My, and right. It's, so it's, I mean, you're getting at the heart of the challenge I mean, that exactly. we face. Exactly, and that's what I'm like foreseeing, and I've been to some of the neighborhood association meetings that are, have been talking about this for years, right? They, it didn't just start, so that fair is gonna be part of this conversation of who pays, how is this equitable? At the same time, like you said, I could hear it in your voice, like it's, it's coming, so we can't avoid it. So what do we do as a city? As you know, it happens along the coast. You see those houses in California and someone holds out and then maybe the insurance keeps paying or mm -hmm. they keep building another wall. So we just have to you know, be aware of yeah, that. So thank you. And thank you for the presentation, because I know this work will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Jemison and, and Chief Hammond. Um, so now we were going to do two advocate panels. There's, there's eight people and one person on Zoom. I'm going to call all eight people down. We have four seats here, and you can go two and two. I think that will, will facilitate a better conversation. Uh, and, and I'm going to call the people's name. You can come and fill in whatever seats you want. That'll be our second panel. Um, Marcos Luna, he's on virtual. Sh Cheryl Del Greco, Latifa Ziad, Gabriela Ramirez, Norman Meisner, Alice Brown, Rick Masoil, I hope I got that right, Rick, uh, Dr. Paul 
Christian or Joe. Oh, Joe's coming. Oh, so Joe Christo and not Dr. Paul and Zachary Cutler. If those people can come down, and in the meantime, if we can go to to um, Senator Lydia Edwards on Zoom. She ready to go? Yep. Hi, I'm just waiting to, trying to start my camera, that's all. Um, but I'm, you can hear me, I'm sure, right? Yes. Yep. Okay, I will just go ahead then, I, I don't know. Um, I keep trying to start the video, but it's not happening. Um, well, in any event, um, I think you kind of know what I look like. And uh, I just wanted to make sure, I just want to make sure that in, in conversations, uh, first of all, um, to my former colleagues, um, I want to say incredible job and incredible hearing so far um, to Gabriella Colletta. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm just very happy and so proud of you and watching you do this hearing and you're killing it. Uh, I know I saw uh, Councilor Murphy and Councilor Baker as well, and I apologize if I, I can't see on the Zoom anybody else, but to my former colleagues, um, great job and thank you for having this conversation. Um, this is this is a, um, a desperately needed planning conversation that, it, and I'm so happy to see the experts in the room, not just those that work for the city, but those who live in the community. I, my, my two cents really honestly in this now representing a Senate district that has even more um, uh, waterfront is that we need to hopefully change our zoning and change the way we plan um, to be grounded in environmental justice. I know one of the things before I uh, left um, the city council was putting forth a, a zoning amendment to change the way in which we judge buildings um, and also how we assess them to include environmental justice standards. And I hope that when we look at the waterfront planning, environmental justice standards are at the core, not just part of the conversation, um, that you plan with those um, as the standard uh, which is something that we've already done with racial equity when we are talking about developing buildings and talking about developing our neighborhoods on land. We made racial justice part of the standards for which a building can be approved with affirmatively furthering for housing. So I'm hoping environmental justice will be part of the plans and planning approval process for our waterfront as we go forward. And what that also includes then is, and mirroring off the other process, is looking at how we include community. Um, how um, developers are required to not only know the standards, but um, come up with ways in which you can heal and in which you can integrate and also equitably and justly um, be true stewards of our environment and our coast. I think this is especially important for what I would consider waterfront sacrifice zones, which are in my neighborhoods of East Boston, um, of course, and, and uh, the North End and Charleston and those who have who have waterfront, but also have displacement crisis, but also have um, industry uh, polluting uh, our air. I believe that these are forms of sacrifice zones and in other means and other processes, sacrifice zones are um, given significantly more money, attention, and also uh, made sure that they're treated with the utmost care in how we move forward in those areas. I, along with, of uh, course, including or looking at sacrifice zones, environmental justice, there's a committee and commission that we have created for affirmatively furthering for housing. I would like, if there's possible, to create another committee um, for environmental justice, okay. where you have uh, some people from the community and people all throughout the, the neighborhood de departments to come in and judge uh, and whether a project or plan should go forward, depending on how just it is at the end. Um, I'm probably speaking more than, and I can't read the room because I can't um, see anybody while I'm talking, but I do want to say um, I'm very excited about this. I do believe that uh, we're going to be continue to lead, actually, as a city, and I just wanted to, again, congratulate Councillor uh, Coletta on her leadership. So thank you, and if you have any questions, but you guys got this. So thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Council. Senator. Oh, that's right. She's a state senator. Yeah, now. I forgot. I drew a blank. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank state you, Senator. <laughs> um, okay, so now what I'm what I'm going to do is we're going to start from left to right. That would be you first. So you can announce who you are, where you're from, your interest, and and just tell us your statement. And then, would you rather me go right to left? Uh, you okay? Yeah. You I'm, look a little nervous. 
Sorry, first time here. Okay, we're no bite, we'll be okay. So we're gonna go left to right, let us know who you are, what organization, or, or where you live, and, and we'll have everyone speak first, and then we'll, we'll do the same sort of thing, questions back and forth, so thank you. You have the floor. Hi, my name is Kelly Sherman. I'm the manager of Waterfront Design at Boston Harbor now. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide public comment at tonight's meeting. The Boston City Council understands the changing nature of the Boston waterfront, the improvements that have been made, and the challenges coastal communities currently face. Across Councilor Coletta's district, there have been not a dearth of planning, but rather layers of planning that follow the guidelines for specific formal processes, but lack comprehensive implementation to serve all re residents holistically. Municipal harbor plans address waterfront parcels outside of designated port areas that are vacant or targeted for redevelopment without fully considering adjacent waterfront parcels that do not meet that criteria. <laughs> Climate ready plans, also known as the Coastal Resilient Solution Plans, address future flood hazards from sea level rise and extreme storms. Although the preliminary design concepts strive to utilize good urban design, they focus primarily on flood control without weighing trade-offs involving waterfront access and visibility or fully assessing the timeline for dramatically altering buildings and roadways. Neighborhood plans tend to look at transportation, housing, and open space issues within neighborhoods but do not fully address climate adaptation strategies and other coastal issues. We've seen numerous parks and private developments reshape the Boston waterfront over the past several decades. In the meantime, the planning strategies across multiple levels of government have not changed to meet new challenges. Chapter 91 has created waterfront access and some public amenities, but the build it and we will come mentality is no longer sufficient to address pressing crises. New criteria for inclusivity and climate change preparedness are needed. This is why Boston Harbor now uses a Harbor Walk 2.0 framework to define our aspirations for the waterfront, a vision for the work ahead, and a framework for ensuring that all waterfront parcels provide connected coastal resilience through a variety of effective climate change adaptations, improved access with physical connectivity and diverse activation strategies that make the Harbor Walk an inviting and enjoyable place for all Bostonians to spend time and equitable design and operation that dismantles barriers preventing people from taking advantage of the waterfront along lines of race, gender, identity, ability, language, and more, and ensuring permanent features and programming that serve the diverse residents of Boston. Boston Harbor now is committed to supporting municipal, state, and grassroots planning efforts to provide a comprehensive and connected vision for a waterfront that meets the economic, social, and hazard protections needs of every resident, especially the most vulnerable in East Boston, Charlestown, North End, and beyond. We are currently working on organizing a community design process along the Fort Point and would like to expand this model to other areas as appropriate. In addition to planning, we are eager to ensure that these visions are fully implemented and have funding mechanisms for maintenance and programming beyond initial implementation. We look forward to remaining engaged and appreciate your commitment to the waterfront. Thank you, Kelly. Good job. Councillor Coletta, Councillor Baker, thanks so much for having me here. Um, my name is Joe Christo. I'm the managing director of the Stone Living Lab. Um, the Stone Living Lab was launched in October of 2020 to explore, research, and communicate how nature-based approaches to climate resilience can help vulnerable coastal regions in New England and beyond adapt to climate change and become more resilient, especially here in Boston. The lab is a unique partnership between Boston Harbor Now, the UMass Boston School for the Environment, the City of Boston, the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, the Massachusetts Executive Office of um, Energy um, and Environmental Affairs, and the National Parks of Boston. My comments today may reflect common priorities among the lab's partners, uh, but my comments are not shared on behalf of any of our municipal, state, or federal partners. So nature-based approaches to climate resilience are strategies that conserve, create, restore, and employ natural resources to enhance climate adaptation, resilience, and mitigation. They complement natural processes and can work in tandem with man-made engineering approaches to address climate threats like sea level rise, coastal flooding, inland flooding, erosion, drought, and heat islands. Nature-based approaches to climate resilience 
also provide co-benefits to ecosystems and people, such as providing more green space in neighborhoods, enhancing biodiversity, and sequestering carbon and other greenhouse gases while being flexible and adaptable. These co-benefits also promote equity and sustainability. Examples of nature-based approaches to climate resilience include salt marshes, constructed coastal berms, living shorelines, restored wetlands, oyster reefs, coral reefs, cobble berms, freshwater wetlands, and seagrass beds. The City of Boston Environment Department and the Boston Planning and Development Agency have incorporated nature-based approaches to climate resilience in their Climate Ready Boston plans. As climate resilience planning and implementation continues, it will be essential to continue to focus on these approaches. As my colleague Kelly from Boston Harbor now stated, uh, we look forward to remaining engaged with this work, are excited to be here, are here as a resource and partner, and appreciate your commitment to the waterfront and to climate resilience. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And we'll let everybody go and then we'll have questions after. Okay. Hi, I'm Cheryl Del Greco. I'm a longtime resident of the North End Waterfront and president of NURA, the North End Waterfront Residents Association. I also serve as the president of the recently formed North End Waterfront Climate Alliance, which is comprised of buildings in the North End and along the waterfront. We appreciate you holding this hearing tonight to bring to light the challenges that our neighborhoods across the city are facing with rising tides and storm surges. Our Climate Alliance group is modeled after our neighbors at the Wharf District, who joined together to bring environmental engineers in to study the existing coastline and look at protecting structures and utilities plan for the future of rising tides and provide waterfront access. The goal of our alliance is much the same. We want to work with the city, state, and federal partners on remedies that will provide a resilient neighborhood with much needed open access to the waterfront. We are hoping to secure some funding from the state for engineering support. As you know, many communities experienced severe flooding during the dual winter storms of 2018. We saw Christopher Columbus Park flooded it, the water pushed out of, onto Atlantic Ave and, and onto Commercial Street. Basements were flooded well into the north end, not just along the waterfront. Many people lost heat and electricity. In September of 2020, the City of Boston produced the Coastal Resilience Solutions for Downtown Boston and the North End, which identified the North End waterfront as a subdistrict that can serve as a useful area for planning. Protecting this subdistrict and its diverse property interests from rising water levels and increasingly frequent storm surges is an important component of flood proofing the entire North End, adjacent downtown neighborhoods, and the city's transportation and utility infrastructure. Success in the North End waterfront can serve as a model for protecting other complex waterfront neighborhoods in Boston and beyond. We are ready to meet with city officials to review climate resiliency planning already in process, discuss appropriate next steps for our neighborhood, and learn about resources currently available to assist our Climate Alliance group with planning. The North End Waterfront stands ready to participate and support solutions that will welcome everyone to enjoy all of Boston's waterfront has to offer. Chief White Hammond, Chief Jemison, we would welcome a seat at the table to work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rick Musil. I'm the Vice President of External Relations for the New England Aquarium and a resident of East Boston. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Coletta, Councillor Baker, for allowing us to be here. It is certainly a great sense of pride to be a part of this distinguished panel of civic leaders. And I also want to echo our thanks to Chief Mary Ellen Boy Hammond and Chief Jemison for being available to so many of us on these important issues. The New England Aquarium is a half century year old ocean conservation organization committed to ensuring a vital and vibrant ocean for all. As an institution located on Central Wharf in the heart of Boston's waterfront, we welcome over 1.3 million visitors annually, who in turn support the small businesses, restaurants, and other establishments that make up our downtown waterfront. In 2019, our organization contributed over 269 million to the Boston and Massachusetts economies and generated nearly $20 million in local and state tax revenues. We wish to continue to serve the Boston community well into the future and ensure that our public space and the surrounding historic waterfront remains a treasured, inclusive, accessible resource for visitors and residents alike. In order for this vision to be realized, it is imperative that a holistic approach to harbor-wide planning for an inclusive waterfront be implemented that prioritizes climate resiliency, accessibility, and participation from all of Boston's residents. 
NOAA recently released its annual report, 2020 Sea Level Rise Technical Report. That report shared that the Northeast region of the United States is expected to see 16 inches of sea level rise by 2050 compared to 2000 levels. If greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions continue to increase, researchers estimate that this number could increase to 6.4 feet for the city of Boston by 2100. And we're already starting to see this harsh reality come to bear. The Boston area currently experiences 11, 11 to 18 high tide, flood, high tide flood days annually, where the tides can re reach up to two feet above the daily average, impacting shorelines, streets, businesses, and more. We all remember the 2018 storm all too well, shutting down public transportation and businesses along our waterfront. We were forced to shutter as well uh, due to excessive flooding along Old Atlantic Ave, State Street, and Milk Street. Rising sea levels aren't only a problem during storms. The phenomenon of blue sky flooding where seawater floods our streets during high tides on sunny days is also occurring with increasing frequency, rendering transit stations and highly trafficked thoroughfares like Morrissey, Morrissey Boulevard, as Councillor Murphy alluded to earlier, largely inaccessible. According to that NOAA report, we can expect to see the overall number, number of high tide flood days increase to 50 to 70 days by 2050. In order for the city to prepare for these climate change impacts and protect both property and life, it is vital that any future waterfront planning process use a harbor-wide approach and the best available client science and resiliency planning to ensure that the natural and built infrastructure along our waterfront can adequately, extend, ex, ex, adequately withstand the impacts of climate change. We're excited to work together with the city to create a waterfront that becomes a true beacon of inclusivity, accessibility, and resiliency, a downtown waterfront for all. And as some have alluded to earlier, Boston has done some amazing things in its past. We cleaned up the harbor. We suppressed an artery. We created the amazing Rose Kennedy Greenway. Harbor-wide resiliency is Boston's next big project. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Rich. <coughs> Joe. <coughs> sorry. Hi. <coughs> I'm sorry if I'm a little underprepared this evening. Uh, my name is Zachary Cutler. I'm a socio-ecological ad adaptation anthropologist. I'm founder of a UN Global Compact Coastal Mitigation Company. I'm on the Association of State Floodplain Managers Regulation Committee. <clears throat> I'm on the NOAA Weather Ready Nation Ambassador. I'm a member of the FEMA Resilient Na Nation Partnership Network, and I'm director of Eco Design Urban Design Company. Um, <clears throat> I'm really happy that we're starting to discuss a comprehensive district-wide planning and transportation process for Boston's continuous waterfront strategies. Um, the, I, I don't need to repeat all of the risks of flood, <clears throat> uh, but the imminent lethal and economic vast threats that we have known for generations and reconfirmed recently by the First Street Foundation. Worldwide urban planning, United Nations sustainable <clears throat> development goals, and simple logic demand the resilient, equitable, accessible waterfront planning. This is all a given. I have worked on many <clears throat> harbor and shipyard resilience urban renewal strategies, including several in New York City, including the World Trade Center and the Big U. <clears throat> um, what I have seen is that, <clears throat> in my experience, municipalities bring in high-profile engineering firms to ascertain the immediate and long-term flood issues of sections of the city or continuous coast and offer solutions without a known budget to work with. Cities often look, forward, look toward uh, European models like Holland, using massive gates along the coast, uh, protecting estuaries. Uh, budgets don't typically call for these solutions and often take generations to accomplish. Use of long-term estuary gates outside of New York uh, we, um, sorry, uh, <laughs> uh, the, hold on a second, private, per, 
arthritis uh, can not bank <coughs> on, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry. Well, I went to this uh, um, USACE uh, event, it was years ago, and they were planning the estuary uh, barriers outside of New York Harbor. And um, that one charrette that we went to, it was large, large, regional, long-term expansion results uh, for solutions for the city. And there was a political change of wind uh, a few months after that event, and it was set aside for another decade. And um, so large end, uh, you know, large scale, uh, infrastructure projects are definitely needed and definitely needed yesterday. Uh, but it's also not something that small businesses and property owners can bank on individually. And it's been a problem in the flood industry for a very long time where the private property owners are waiting for municipal action and don't know how much they should budget for their own property. Should they budget for one year and you know one, holi one hurricane season and get some removable uh, rapid deployment solution? Or do they build their own seawall? And they don't know what the city is doing. And this isn't just in Boston, this is in cities throughout the nation. Um, and uh, so that gap uh, is a big problem, and it's one of the main problems uh, in terms of moving forward. Um, you know, public-private collaborative waterfront resilience, uh, that action can't take place without working together with public-private uh, initiatives. Um, the, uh, that's one, um, you know, regional long-term uh, problem, but near term, private interim solutions are, like I said, difficult to budget without municipal participation. Um, <clears throat> and this has, you know, caused a decades long delay in, in cities. Um, and it leaves the private property owners in limbo and delays uh, any sort of uh, district wide or uh, trans uh, property line solutions. Um, <clears throat> and one of the big problems also, in addition to the gap, and it perpetuates the gap, is uh, communications issues. And in Boston, it's gone back generations, um, <clears throat> and uh, especially with the lack of comprehensive master plan, uh, there's also a lack of a public-private project oversight committee in the city, which I have found in New York City and other cities have, and it seems Boston is missing that entity for some reason. Um, and this, I think, is another uh, part that perpetuates the uh, status quo of spot zoning. And uh, another thing that Boston is missing um, and it relates to the spot zoning. And the big picture as well is Boston is missing a community rating system coordinator with FEMA. And this affects the municipal insurance and ability to respond to disasters. It relates to insurance uh, costs for the city and the public. Uh, Boston is missing that in addition to a public-private uh, uh, project oversight committee. Um, the, um, covered that, um, the other thing that was mentioned, I think, in the hearing letter was, uh, also very important, which is the municipal role to protect our waterfront without depending on investments from private entities or developers. Uh, and <clears throat> when it takes, uh, when it comes to remediate the parcel by parcel approach uh, versus a district-wide scale. Um, 
And that is a problem that we can see in a lot of cases. We've all just discussed the parcel by parcel zoning and, and so on. Uh, but one of the, the great examples and uh, a beacon for the rest of Boston is East Boston and uh, what's being achieved with the vision and progress of Piers Park 3. That has all taken, again, much longer than it should have and uh, needs to be. Uh, and that is including, uh, that involves a stalwart, you know, 100 year old entity that is specifically designed to preserve land like that. And East Boston it has been struggling for years to try and make it this far. Charlestown doesn't have an entity like that. Um, and uh, another thing that we talked about, uh, that somebody talked about, is uh, redirection. When one property can afford to protect its own uh, property lines, then there's redirection onto neighbors and into other conduits. Um, and um, these, these sort of issues are, are in, in Charlestown, it's strange because the, the primary two developments that are going to really severely impact the population and therefore transportation in Charlestown are the Sullivan Square development and the uh, Bunker Harbor uh, housing development. Both are going to really, I think it's uh, several hundred thousand between the two of them. And um, it's strange that those two of Charlestown's biggest projects are in two of the most vulnerable flood areas in Charlestown. And somebody mentioned earlier also the term of uh, sacrificial property, where uh, the Bunker Hill development is now, was once known as a sacrificial property by the city. Uh, the Leventhal maps at the library can show you that. And what does um, that mean? Well, it, it was uh, used as an industrial pit. And uh, if you look at so the flood dumping. maps. Yeah, dumping. And also, it just happens to be where a, well, related, a river uh, went led down to a canal. Uh, and if you look at the maps, that conduit from the highway down to the water is a risk for heat island. It's a high risk for storm water. It's a high risk for sea level rise. It, it, it basically faces all the risks possible that we're all talking about here is faced by the Bunker Hill development. And for the some BHA reason- housing development you're talking yes, about. Yes, yes. And for some reason it's being, uh, you know, it, it done without much consideration for canopy or for those risks. Um, and it, it really, it, also is disconcerting that the uh, plan reports for both East Boston and for Charlestown, uh, the Charlestown plan uh, and presentation recently shown uh, to the public, it, cut, it shows basically the western half of Charlestown and it cuts off the east side. Mm -hmm. And it, the transportation um, uh, studies show bike paths and uh, pedestrian paths. And those paths suggested are pathways up to uh, Sullivan Square. And like I said, the entire east side of Charlestown is cut off in these presentations. When I asked about that, I was told that they ran out of paper. Uh, and that east side, of course, holds most of the vulnerability for flooding on the harbor side. And so that wasn't able to be discussed. Uh, and when <clears throat> we started discussing open space, I was asking, you know, what are the different definitions of types of open space? I was told by an urban planner of the BPDA that it's uh, all universally called open space. And um, again, the big, one of the biggest problems is the, the, the gap and uh, the public-private rift between a, uh, a district-wide solution. Um, there are some benefits that somebody else mentioned. Uh, for instance, the um, Harbor Walk. 
uh, and that is one benefit for going over those, those property lines. But of course, that won't work everywhere in the harbor. Um, I'll stop now, but I really hope to participate in the process in the future. I think I have a lot to offer. I have two generations worth of studies and reports and documents and letters and all sorts of resources available to the city. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Hi, my name is Latifa uh, Ziad, and I work with the Neighborhood of Affordable Housing in East Boston. Um, I serve as the Director of Community Engagement and Resilience. I want to um, first thank um, the leadership around this issue, uh, Councilor um, Mayor Wu, Chief Hammond, um, Chief Jameson, um, also um, Councilor Baker, and of course, Councilor Coletta. Um, I want to thank Councilor uh, Murphy for being here, as well as Council President Ed Flynn for sending um, his words and remarks of the importance of this. Um, most of the people around the table here, I know in some capacity and form, very intimately often um, do we talk about water um, in East Boston. But I bet uh, very few of them, maybe only one person perhaps in this room, knows one of the key reasons I got involved in uh, waterfront work and resilience work. Um, it was because as a young person I had reoccurring nightmares about tsunamis. And so very passionately and as a resiliency person, instead of running away, I ran to the water. And um, thus explains um, the trials of my own life running into things. But one of the um, key uh, pieces of doing coastal work that I found out very quickly was that you have to have and do these things in coordinated effort as a coalition. Um, I worked with local government for many years, um, more than a decade, and in that work I realized how important it is to have local government leadership, um, to be in concert with federal government um, for resources as well as best practices, and also to connect regionally because there is no borderline on the water, right? So we all uh, share in this. Um, and also connecting with private uh, industry as well because they are the driving force. I mean, Massachusetts is one of the number one financing states um, in the United States. So if we really allocated some of our resources towards this as from the private sector, you would see substantial uh, difference in some of the things that happen, just even in terms of leadership. Um, also coalition building with colleagues here, we're part of the waterfront, the, the, the coalition for resilient and inclusive waterfront that just had a waterfront summit this week um, at Roxbury Community College. And part of that was also the statement that as much as there are waterfront communities in Boston, it is also something that affects inland communities as well. Um, I trek from Dorchester to East Boston daily, and in that trek, you have to be careful if you go through Franklin Park, if it's flooded, you have to turn around, or drive through Morrissey Boulevard, as was mentioned earlier. Um, or when I worked over at the New England Aquarium, I would drive into East Boston, and I probably shouldn't say this park, get on the blue line and take one stop over, and there were days that I couldn't go because it was flooded, and it was like playing Russian roulette. And for me, having some economic base, I could just jump in my car and drive back. But there were so many people who were just stranded, didn't know what they were going to do um, at that point. Um, working in community economic development, I, we have a unique interest in affordable housing um, along the waterfront because there is a strong need for housing. Um, uh, it, it was just mentioned the BHA housing that is in East Boston is a really good example of how you can be really close but miss it because in East Boston, the BHA housing, the windows face each other instead of facing the water. What an atrocity to be so close 
um, to the water and not be able to benefit from it. We have colleagues uh, right adjacent to us in East Boston in Chelsea who don't have a port to come out to go kayaking. And so even if you don't have an access point for water for recreation, you lose and are disconnected um, from the water as well. I want to push for um, a czar of water. There's no way that any agency can on the periphery deal with such a big and important issue um, as what is happening on our waterfront right now. And I think that's the only way you can deal with true equity issues. Um, looking at what happens with linkage, uh, where you have a choice to build on the waterfront and put other people in the inland. Um, there should be more stringent looks at how you have access, even from uh, a, an issue of just visibility. Um, and people should be able to enjoy the waterfront no matter what kind of economic background they, they come from. Um, and then just looking at, as well, looking at issues of um, public-private access. There are messages that are sent to communities, whether you say you want to have inclusion or not. If there's no bathrooms that are accessible along the waterfront walk, or if the food places that are in places like Seaport have no low hanging of food sources where people can access food if they want to do recreation out there, then it's a deterrent. So what kind of things can be put in place to really um, be inviting to all of Boston? And I don't want to lose sight that this is also a climate change issue, um, that when we have models that we implement to judge what kind of zoning we're going to use, what kind of recommendations we're going to do for uh, building along the waterfront, if we, if we use models that are not the uh, middle ground or more aggressive models, then we might find ourselves caught off guard um, when um, we do have that, those 100-year those floods. Um, so I just want to end on that, think about equity, think about leadership, think about financing this, because this can't happen without money. And um, I want to thank all of you for hosting this, because this is um, very forward thinking and something that's necessary. Thank you, Latifa. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Gabriela Ramirez. I was born and raised in East Boston, but my parents immigrated here from El Salvador. I am the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Trustees Boston Waterfront Initiative, which advances a bold vision for iconic public open space on the Boston waterfront. The Boston Waterfront Initiative seeks to create accessible, climate resilient open space that serves diverse community needs and brings valuable, value to our vulnerable harbor city. And we are so thrilled to have our first site be Pierce Park 3 in East Boston. For the past two years, we have worked alongside the community to develop the design of the park and future programming through our community surveys and public design review meetings. We have focused on making the project accessible to the community and provided various options to engage with us and share your feedback. Community members can meet us at Pierce Park for our regular community events, text us the responses to our questions, email us, fill out our community survey, or simply sit down with our team and talk about their opinions and their memories and stories on the waterfront. We've heard many stories and memories from people, such as the quinceanero pictures, like mine. Many kids have fond memories with their grandparents at the park, and parents who do not have outdoor space in their apartments have shared that they seek an outdoor space that they can call theirs, which are our parks in East Boston. As I mentioned, we've hosted community meetings in English and Spanish to discuss the project. But most importantly, we've met the community where they are. We've gone to the farmer's market, block parties, parks, local food distributions, peace circles, cultural celebrations, to talk with the community, learn about what the waterfront means to them, how our work can, can help amplify their stories and memories, and how we can make Pierce Park 3 a welcoming space where everyone feels welcomed and can engage in the waterfront, but also serves as a climate resilient structure that supports our vulnerable community. And we continue to seek community input on Pierce Park 3 and work with our community partners to ensure that this project is community driven and that Pierce Park 3 can be a welcoming climate resilient space that my family, friends, neighbors, and everyone in East Boston can feel welcome to. To this day, we have engaged with over 3,500 people and we continue having those conversations. I will be also sharing my testimony in Spanish. 
Hola, mi nombre es Gabriela Ramírez. Nací y crecí en East Boston, pero mis padres emigraron aquí desde El Salvador. Soy la coordinadora de alcance comunitario de The Trustees Boston Waterfront Initiative. El Boston Waterfront Initiative busca crear espacios abiertos, accesibles y resistentes al cambio climático que satisface las diversas necesidades de la comunidad y aporta valor a nuestra vulnerabilidad ciudad. Estamos orgullosamente de decir que nuestro primer proyecto es el Parque Azul 3 en East Boston, Pierce Park 3. Durante los últimos dos años hemos trabajado, trabajado junto con la comunidad para desarrollar el diseño del parque y la futura programación a través de nuestras encuestas y reuniones públicas. Nos hemos enfocado en hacer que el proyecto sea accesible para la comunidad y brindamos varias opciones para que la comunidad pueda compartir sus comentarios. Los miembros de la comunidad pueden reunirse con nosotros en el Parque Azul, asistir a nuestros eventos, enviarnos un mensaje de texto o correo electrónico, llenar nuestra encuesta comunitaria o sentarse con nuestro equipo para hablar sobre sus opiniones. Hemos escuchado muchas historias y recuerdos que la gente tiene con la costa de Boston, como las historias de las niñas que van a tomarse sus fotos de quinceañeras, como la mía. Muchos niños tienen recuerdos con sus abuelos y varios padres que no tienen espacio al aire libre en sus apartamentos han compartido que buscan crear un espacio al aire libre que puedan decir que es de ellos como los parques de East Boston. Como mencioné, hemos organizado reuniones comunitarias en inglés y español para conversar sobre el proyecto, pero lo más importante que hemos hecho es ir a donde está la comunidad. Hemos ido al mercado de agricultores, a las block parties, a los parques, a las distribuciones locales de alimentos, círculos de paz y más celebraciones para hablar con la comunidad, aprender sobre lo que significa la costa para ellos, cómo nuestro trabajo puede ayudar y amplificar sus historias y recuerdos y cómo podemos hacer el Parque Azul 3 un espacio donde todos se sientan bienvenidos y puedan conectarse con la costa mientras estamos haciendo infraestructura que nos apoya a nuestra comunidad. Y seguimos buscando la, la opinión de la comunidad sobre el Parque Azul 3 y trabajamos junto con nuestros colegas comunitarios para garantizar que el proyecto sea diseñado por la comunidad y que el Parque Azul 3 pueda ser un espacio para todos y resistente al cambio climático, que mi familia, amigos, vecinos y todos en East Boston puedan sentar, sentirse bienvenidos. A este día hemos... Uh, hablado con más de 3,500 personas y seguimos teniendo esas conversaciones importantes. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, You're good. Hi. hi thank you. Uh, my name is Norman Meisner. I'm the chair of the board of trustees of the Harbor Towers One Condominium Trust and a member of the WAF District Council Climate Ready Task Force, the task force that um, Chief uh, White Hammond uh, referred to in her remarks earlier. Um, Harbor Towers and the Wharf District Council both strongly support the goals of this hearing and the work in East Boston and Charlestown that's going on. The absence of a comprehensive waterfront planning process in recent decades has led to a number of unfortunate outcomes, including misguided parcel-by-parcel -parcel decision making, a lack of focus on the impending effects of climate change, and a perception that the Boston waterfront is not a place for every resident of the Commonwealth to enjoy. The history of the downtown waterfront municipal harbor plan should be instructive to the council in setting a productive path forward. That municipal harbor process had the earmarks of being driven by the needs and interests of certain waterfront property owners and developers <clears throat> and not by comprehensive public planning goals. The planning group discussions that occurred centered on accommodating the developers' plans and deciding what offsets the city could demand from them, but not for developing a vision for equity, diversity, and climate resilience for the waterfront first, and then assessing development proposals. This led to the downtown waterfront municipal harbor plan ultimately focusing on two properties, the harbor garage site and the hook lobster property which together comprise a mere two acres of a 42-acre waterfront district. 
A new process should focus on creating a public vision for the waterfront first. Only after the vision is set and the standards for bringing it about are prepared should the city consider specific proposals from developers. Another failing of that process, in, in part because it started so early on before climate change was the topic it is today, was the absence of climate change mitigation from the discussion. According to Climate Ready Boston report um, for downtown Boston, a major storm would cause approximately $1.4 billion in damage. And that's before inflation. Um, the MHP's focus on facilitating two large projects did not address a district-wide approach to mitigating the impacts of sea level rise. Finally, the MHP drafters failed to incorporate the concerns, comments, and contributions of either the local or broader community into their eventual plan. The advisory board members heard about development proposals, but little about their potential impact on the neighborhood, and very little input from the committee was accepted. There was no final report to the advisory board for review. There was a 16-month gap between the final advisory board meeting and the issuance of a proposed MHP. We can be doing better. There is a clear path before the council to avoid these mistakes. It should hold true to the concept that comprehensive district-wide planning must precede development. It should respect the great work done by the Green Ribbon Commission in its review of the seaport redevelopment. It should respect the prior work done by participants in the Greenway District Planning Study, which set reasonable district-wide limits on height and density along the park. It should take advantage of the work being done by the Wharf District Council Climate Ready Task Force, which has been bringing together the private and public sectors to create a conceptual district-wide protection resiliency plan. It should ensure that the planning process genuinely incorporates the views of the entire community for amenities, programming, and public realm improvements that foster a welcoming and inclusive waterfront. With that, I'll go off script and talk a little bit about what the Climate Ready Task Force is doing. How much off script? It's 755, so. Oh, very little. Okay. <laughs> very little. It is a private public partnership that's been mentioned before it's being implemented. Some, some of the 16 property owners have contributed money. The state has contributed a grant. And we have um, an engineering team working on taking the good work that was done in Climate Ready Boston and applying it property by property, but also in between the properties, so that nothing is an island. And um, you know, so we, the Climate Ready Task Force is happy to work with the city council in any way we can to help use this model for the other parts of the city that need the same kind of help. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for coming out and staying late and, and giving us your time. I just have a, a couple, couple quick things. Um, Joe, you had mentioned nature-based solutions, and then you had mentioned estuary gates. Is an estuary gate a natural, like, because a, like, a gate to me is like the big, Iron gates that they're talking about, but an estuary says, "What? What is a, a an estuary gate?" There are certainly overlaps. And is, it a, is it a natural? Is it a natural solution? Yes, there there are definitely uh, overlaps with nature-based solutions, but that that one particular example uh, is uh, comparing the estuary gates uh, in, in Holland. And it's more of a geoengineering uh, project than, than nature-based solutions. But it does uh, interrelate in terms of the ability to implement some of the nature-based solutions. Yeah, and Joe, when you say, Joe, did you used to work in City Hall? Where were you? Uh, I was uh, at the mayor's office, and then I was at the PPDA. Oh, OK, yeah, if you look familiar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Not that that matters, but uh, so will you talk? We, a we bit? rode the elevator together. Yeah. <laughs> will you talk a little bit about, you know, if we're talking nature based, you know, and again, I'm at, I'm at Burns, Berms. I had a sister that lived in Holland for mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years, and, and I mean, they've got 20 foot berms 
and it's pretty amazing to see the way it all stitches together. Will you just just briefly talk about nature-based solutions? Yeah, you're, you're right on with uh, how you're talking talking about them, and there's just such a wide range of them. You know, some of them do involve um, some engineering. Some of them are just enhancing existing ecosystems. Um, you know, and, and as I mentioned before, the Climate Ready Boston reports are already incorporating them yeah. um, into them. So, um, you know, we're, we're happy to, it's, it's what the Stone Living Lab is focusing on, is researching um, uh, how effective these can be. Um, and, uh, and really, especially in urban environments um, and high energy environments like Boston Harbor. Yeah, and the Stone Living Lab is out of UMass. Do you have a, is it, is it? based over at the Columbia Point campus? It's a partnership, actually, between Boston Harbor Now, UMass, and the federal, state, and local partners I mentioned before. So it's, it's uh, collaboratively led. The two lead partners are Boston Harbor Now mm. in Charlestown and UMass Boston over at the Columbia Point uh, yeah, campus. Yeah, because when we, when we, you know, I've been here for a little while, so when we started talking about berms and resiliency measures and all I could think was Holland. Every berm that you have, there's bicycles on top of it, and that's yeah. how, you, you know, so you, there's ways to go at multi-prong um, solutions to, to different things that, that are happening in the city, so. You're right on, and, and you just hit on one of the co-benefits that I was talking about, you know, the, when these nature-based approaches um, are, you know, protecting neighborhoods from flooding two days a year, the other 363 days a year, they can be an asset to the people and environment of that neighborhood. Yeah, and, and, and so my focus is, not my focus, this is our focus here tonight, but, but where I apply this is in um, Akazusko Circle, Marcy Boulevard Hole connection, and like by Mokley Park, you look at a, a, a berm there, that's a perfect spot for, the, for that natural base berm where we can put bikes on top that get from JFK to Broadway Station, Andrew Station. So. Yeah, you know, and, and that's exactly what Chief White Hammond and Chief Jemison were talking about before. Uh, you know, we, we are, they are incorporating so many uh, nature-based approaches into Moakley Park. It's, it's a great example. Yeah, yeah, because the, 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 when we talk about the gates and the amount of engineering and things like that that need to, in something that's not, it's man-made and I, 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 that scares me if we decide on that path, billions of dollars for gates, yep. sea gates, and that sort of thing. When I think it's, I think it's, you know, parcels and connecting them together, and a lot of it is, is, is nature-based. That's, that's right, and I thought, you know, Chief White Hammond also summarized, um, you know, uh, perfectly why those gates um, really don't provide um, the, yeah. the benefits that nature-based It's only, can. it's more for a storm surge than, than the sea level rise. That's right. And, and could I also make one clarification? Yeah. Um, I, I heard one of my co-panelists here mention that uh, the uh, coastal resilience solutions for East Boston and Charlestown was not covering all of the neighborhood. Um, that's accurate, but that's because the previous report, Coastal Resilient Solutions for East Boston and Charlestown Phase 1, covered that part of the neighborhood. Okay. And then the Phase 2 report that was recently released complemented that report. So in tandem, they cover so all the of two the So the two of them make a, com make a complete plan. Correct. Yeah. Okay. If we can, Marco Sunas has been on to testify. Oh, geez, yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. Sorry. Uh, we have someone that's going to testify, and we'll get to your questioning after. I, I forgot about that. I apologize. We have Marco Luna on virtual. We're ready to go there. Thank well, you guys for, you your, for your patience. Mr. Luna. Hello, I can't, I'm not allowed this for my video on apparently, so I'll just uh, talk. Um, thank you for holding this hearing and uh, for making the time. Um, I'm, my name is Marco Saluna and I'm a resident of East Boston and I'm also a member of the board of directors of Green Roots, a community led environmental justice organization working with residents of Chelsea and East Boston. And tonight I'm speaking on behalf of Green Roots. Um, I will note that Green Roots is an author on the letter submitted by the Boston Waterfront Partners, which speaks in more detail uh, and highlights concerns that we share and how the various ongoing planning processes are moving forward in the city generally. But I want to highlight some Green Roots specific concerns about the East Boston planning processes in which we've engaged as well as some specific issues for climate planning. So regarding community engagement, um, the city has made clear that community engagement is important for the planning processes. 
And for one, I appreciate that this hearing is available in person and online. And uh, in general, I want to acknowledge the city has made some strides in improving language access, uh, although I, I have to admit I don't see interpretation offered tonight. Um, but regarding the engagement with community members on various planning um, uh, processes and discussions on how to proceed, they're still, for the most part, um, somewhat hard to penetrate for average residents uh, because there's a lot of jargon that gets used uh, about real estate or traffic and environmental studies or housing policies and zoning minutia. So I think there can still be work in making the processes more comprehensible for community members to meaningful engage. And as a good example, I want to actually want to acknowledge uh, Chief Jemison's very clear explanation of uh, designated port areas and the implications of changing that designation. So a good example there. I think it's important too to uh, meet people where they are on these efforts at community engagement uh, in order to start meaningful conversations that are relevant to the residents. Um, as a resident of East Boston, I've frequently been asked by city planners as well as consultants about our vision, for example, for East Boston in five years and what it should look like. Um, but for a lot of residents, many of whom, most of whom are renters uh, in precarious positions, that kind of question isn't very meaningful because they're more concerned about immediate uh, pressures for displacement and rising rents. Um, and not every group in East Boston has the same concerns or worries. So uh, one, um, F, one kind of strategy for getting better engagement is to figure out ways to connect those things to those immediate concerns. Um, I've heard planners um, complain or, or uh, lament that they often encounter uh, a lot of cynicism from community members who do engage. Uh, and that cynicism is grounded in experience of being told that they're quote unquote being heard during processes that nevertheless result in the same outcomes, which don't seem to reflect that input that was provided by residents. Um, and it may be because those decision priorities are dictated by financial and political realities. Um, but in, in any case, it would be helpful that the community's concerns be acknowledged and also that if they can't be accommodated uh, because of those other priorities, that that be stated frankly. Uh, and that the processes or the priorities that are leading those decisions be made clear up front. Um, on the point of displacement, particularly for low-income immigrant and people of color, of course, that's a citywide concern. And in East Boston, we are very concerned about what Councillor Coletta referred to, green gentrification. Um, and what we've seen is that it's taken the form of high-end luxury private development that's apparently been the only solution for investing in the really resiliency of our shoreline up to, the, to date. Um, and we are glad to hear that the mayor wants to see affordable housing prioritized and plans in East Boston. However, if we are planning for the future of our children and our grandchildren, we need to come to grips with the fact that the waterfront may not be the most viable space for residential properties. And even more so if we're talking about low-income people with reduced economic capacity to bounce back from repeated floods. Uh, retreating from the shore is certainly not an easy conversation, but it may be better than a conversation about what to do with displaced people in the aftermath of a major storm or flood event or a hurricane. And finally, um, I want to highlight that it, it appears that we have some missing players uh, in the room from the room rather. East Boston has been dominated by transportation infrastructure, I think we can acknowledge from the International Airport, the three tunnels, the major state highways, the private shipping terminals, transit lines. And this infrastructure has been an environmental and land use burden for the community for a long time. But it's also critical infrastructure that's at great risk from climate related damage with, with impacts that would of course reverberate throughout the region. So the question is, where is MassDOT and MBTA and MassPort uh, in these discussions for this planning? Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. Um, with that, Councilor Coletta, do you have questions for this panel? Uh, I am I'm looking at the time. I have so many questions. And I know that you all have taken time out of your day to be here. And I just want to say thank you so much. 
your perspective, your expertise is invaluable. And because of all of you, I am hopeful as we embark on this work together. Um, and I just want to say thank you to you all. <clears throat> I will hold my questioning, and we can move forward with public testimony. Okay. Councilor Murphy, you have any questions for this panel? No direct questions, just this feeling of, I kept thinking, thank God you live in Boston and care about the waterfront. There's so much knowledge and knowing that we're going to continue this conversation and make sure that your voices are heard in all different aspects from you know, being able to have access to the parks to making sure. I loved your analogy of the tsunami and then you're here fighting to make sure we keep it away. So um, great panelists, so thank you to, for the, to the chair and the sponsor, and know that this isn't going to end tonight, that this conversation will continue, and I'll be part of it, so thank you. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. And um, we did, I, one thing that I heard that stuck with me as a water czar, someone that would be that, too. that person that I think could be or should be or would be responsible for all this like the the one stop shop for everything that we're doing here so maybe that's something we we should work on for sure yeah um you guys are excused thank you very much for thank your time you. we're going to go to public thank testimony now mr um calderelli albert you're first you can come to this stand in the back side there or and then also i have chris mancini chris you can come up and come to this podium here Yeah, and thank you for your patience. Sorry we had you waiting so long there, sir. And that means I'm not just taking two minutes. <laughs> we'll give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the uh, president and executive director of the East Boston Community Development Corporation. Can you state your name too, please, just for the Oh, record. and my name is Al Calderelli. The East Boston Community Development Corporation has been around for over 60 years. We have, have a long history of trying to develop the uh, marine industrial industries in East Boston. I'm going to have to put my glasses on. We invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in businesses like Cashman Marine Works, now known as Boston Harbor Shipyard in Marina. We are presently working on the old Hess site on Condor Street in East Boston with Boston Harbor to expand their ship repair operations, as well as Cora Electric, which supplies uh, repairs to the drawbridges that you see all around us. However, it's become abundantly clear that the marine industry is disappearing from vast sections of East Boston, especially the East Boston waterfront. And all efforts to induce new marine businesses to come to East Boston have failed. And believe me, we've worked hard to make it happen. This has created unused and dilapidating properties, an eyesore and a detriment to East Boston. The designated port area has to go. Over one third of East Boston is in the flood zone, as you've been pointing out. And in the near future, we're looking to see over 50% be in the flood zone. Waterfront construction is needed to confront the rising tides. However, construction has to be strictly monitored. We don't want to see in East Boston the same mistakes that were made uh, in the past where monstrosities were built all around us that were built in a way that drove so many of our people out of East Boston. East Boston has always been a welcoming immigrant community. And it was done so because our three-deckers were affordable. You could go there and live and raise a family. That's how my family came here. 
That's how family after family from different immigrant communities came to East Boston. That's no longer the case. There is no real affordable housing in East Boston. So as we go forward, I think that we have to have in place, if we're going to be building on the waterfront, a building code that's strict and exclusive. You don't want a building code like we had in the past where any developer who came in who wanted to see a change just ran to the zoning code, code and all of a sudden, instead of a five-story building, it was a 10-story building. That has to stop. The other thing that has to stop is that there has to be much more community access to each of these properties, whether they're private or not. There's no reason. We own property on the waterfront. And when we plan our development, we plan community access. Someone mentioned kayaks, uh, the gentleman who was on the thing. We have a site in East Boston. We want to do affordable housing on it. But guess what? We signed an agreement with some people, with one of the community groups, to launch their kayaks from the site. These are all things that can be done at the same time that we drew the uh, preparation for uh, flood and, and everything on these sites. Now, when it comes to affordable housing, we have to stop the, the charade of calling things affordable that are nowhere near affordable for the people that we want in our community, that we want to keep in our community. In the old uh, things, one bedroom, was uh, $3,000. Oh, wow, that's affordable. That, that counted in the past administration as affordable housing. And what do we see now? There ain't a soul in those houses that has anything to do with East Boston. They're all transients who go there for a little while and leave. We need true affordable housing, two and three bedroom apartments where people can come and raise their families. There has to be in the zoning a, a, a restriction on what is affordable. It must be between the 50 and 60 percent of the mean income. That would result in, in anywhere from 1,400 to 2,000 dollars for for apartments, which alone is not the lowest price in the world. But when you talk about 80, 90 percent, like they're doing now. You're talking about over $3,000 for a one-bedroom apartment. That's got to stop. So we look to see East Boston built. We look to see it, but we want to see it done in a way that helps our community, that returns it to what it was, a community where people can bring their families from anywhere and make sure that whatever country they come from, that there's a place and a welcoming place for them and that we can continue to do what we've always been, be a welcoming immigrant community where people could raise their families and go on from there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Calderelli. And Chris. I don't want to follow that. that was... <laughs> well, you have to. This, those, that's the, the breaks you get, Chris. Yeah. I'm Chris Mancini. I'm the executive director of Save the Harbor, Save the Bay. And uh, I'm a little angry because everyone else took all my talking points. So I don't have a, a ton to add. But uh, my dad used to sing this um, cheesy country song when I was a kid. I've got some oceanfront property in Arizona. And we <laughs> thought that was just hilarious at six years old. But you know, I'm looking at the maps over the past couple of years. And I know there's someone out there looking at their house going, oh, if I just wait this out, I'm going to have ocean firm property. Um, I'm not one of them. Um, I just want to emphasize a couple of the things that people have said uh, tonight. You know, this is coordination and collaboration. Um, we need strong leadership and public investment in this. We can't, we've got to rely on, on, the, on the private developer uh, money, but, you know, Rick used my other examples. Uh, we did the big dig. We did. Um, we cleaned up the harbor. We can do these big projects. We need strong public investment. We need clear uh, coordination and leadership. And I think um, broadening, you know, 
the waterfront, there's unique things that can happen on the waterfront, and so we don't want to, um, I think, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the name, but the gentleman who just spoke, you know, pointing out you can do housing and waterfront access. You can do multiple things, so we don't want to lose sight of things that can only be done on the water um, if you can move something across the street um, that, that could be could be put in multiple places. So as we go forward, you know, I hope you will consider Save the Harbor uh, an asset. You know, for over 30 years, we have um, worked closely with the community, starting with the Boston Harbor cleanup, um, and now you know, connecting people to the waterfront from Nahant all the way down to Nantasket. And we re re retain um, really close uh, partnerships with over 200 youth and community serving organizations. Um, and we also lead and manage the Metropolitan Beaches Commission for the state legislature. Uh, Senator Edwards is a commissioner, um, to name one. And um, we've guided recommendations for operations, infrastructure, maintenance, access, equity, and inclusion when it comes to our public spaces along the water uh, since 2008. And we're about to publish our report on um, race, disability, and language. And our the commission plans to turn their attention really focused to climate resiliency on all of those areas. So again, we're here. Hope you'll, you'll count on us. Um, and you know, just seeing how many people are here, you know, 16 groups, I think I counted, represented just in this room tonight, um, focused on the waterfront. So there's that, that glimmer of hope that, that there are that many of us that care about this. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> and at this point, at this time, we have some people that are going to do Zoom testimony. I'll just I'll call the first two, and hopefully they're in line. Julie, I think it's War Warmer, and Dan Jaffe. Thank you. And just so people know, it'll be Rita Lara, Maria Lyons, and then Sarah McCarman. Whichever way they come to the camp, come up. Hi. 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 Uh, my name is Julie Wormser. Hi, Julie. Hi. How's it going? Good. Long evening. So um, I am delighted to um, testify to yes. for the Mystic River Watershed Association, which covers the north side of Boston Harbor and the old port of Boston in the lower Mystic River in Chelsea Creek. And we strongly support the effort to increase climate resilience and racial and economic equity across the waterfront and are glad to participate in this conversation. I agree with so much that's already been said, so I'm limiting my testimony specifically to the portion of Boston's waterfront that's located in state zoned designated port areas. These DPAs make up much of the flood prone waterfront around East Boston and Charlestown and I wanna make an argument for fixing the regulations instead of getting rid of them. A lot of the problem is with the current regulations, which are too restricted um, to both um, allow businesses to, to be profitable and also maximize public benefits such as equi equitable economic development, climate resilience, and great waterfront parks for people to stay cool in hot summers. I also want to flag that a lot of these areas are highly flood prone and therefore not great areas for affordable housing for people who have a hard time recovering if they are flooded. So a couple points. Designated port area regulations profoundly need to be updated, but they shouldn't be eliminated. They were established by the state in 1978 in order to protect public values that would otherwise disappear if left to market forces. In the four decades since, the local and global economy has changed in then unimaginable ways without the regulations changing. For example, as you heard before, sea level rise and extreme coastal storms threaten both the DPAs themselves and multiple inland neighborhoods lying behind them. By the end of the century, these areas are expected to flood with salt water as often as every other day. 
Second, the maritime economy has radically changed, which is why so many of these areas are not profitable. Just as today's global economy and the internet was unimaginable in the late 1970s, we have no idea what a successful late 21st century Boston working waterfront would look like. BPA regulations need to expand the range of viable, non-polluting, flood resilient industrial activities allowed in these zones. And third, since DPAs were created, Greater Boston has grown to have among the greatest income inequality in the United States. DPAs historically provided good paying jobs that did not require college degrees. Low income residents nearby are rapidly being displaced by higher income people. If you do market based housing on the waterfront, that causes further economic displacement. The DPAs themselves act as a dampening effect on that. So if you update designated port area reg regulations, you could focus on clean flood resilient industries that employ people who can't afford college. There is tremendous pressure on the old port of Boston to be converted for market rate development. I'm worried that if these DPA uh, regulations are lifted, we're not gonna get the outcome we want in terms of equitable economic development and waterfront parks, we're gonna get more high-end condos. We don't wanna see Boston's working waterfront dismantled. Um, we would love to see a comprehensive planning for Boston's waterfront that prioritizes equity, climate resilience, and great open space. And we think that should involve updating rather than eliminating DPAs. Thank you very much for your time. I'd be happy to talk about that more another, another day. Thank you. Dan Jaffe. Or Rita Lara. Yes, I'm here. Okay, Dan, Sorry. You, can, you can go. Uh, first of all, I, I support a lot of the arguments that have taken place so far. Uh, my name is Dan Jaffe. I'm a resident of Charlestown for now almost 40 years. Uh, I'm, an, I'm very active with the community, trying to find ways to improve our small space of our population can move about without as much hardship as we do today. Uh, we're almost an island and very difficult for us to get in and out. Uh, I was involved in the Cana project, which is probably long since out of your minds, but that was the precursor to the Big Dig. Uh, and uh, we worked very hard to get uh, the Gilmore, the, excuse me, the um, Margaret Hill, uh, Zakin Bridge built. Uh, that was a lot of effort to get it to happen. I was also involved in the Spectacle Island uh, uh, land taking to prepare it for uh, cleaning up the harbor from the leakage from the, the old junkyard that used to exist there. So now we have a very clean harbor because of that. So I was also involved in that. So as you can see, I've been involved in the community for quite a few years and have made significant uh, progress for us. Today I come to you hopefully to set, it, set us on a better course once again. The Little Mystic Channel area has been neglected way too long. It's time for it to shine from an industrial backwater space to a true park space our community really needs. Uh, we're very low in having open space, and this is one of the spaces that we could recover and make into a park space that would be very beneficial. Uh, offering a new recreational space for small boating and swimming. Yes, swimming. The channel space is clean. It can be swimmed in. Uh, but before we get there, we need to set the stage with a climate resiliency. So to, clean, to deal with that, so far we've uh, seen phase one deal with the MBTA garage space from Somerville's Draw 7 Park down to Alfred Street and onward along to Ryan Park Playground, which is now uh, in the final design phases. Uh, and now we have the Flatley Group from the Schraff Center and onto their 425 Member Street project dealing with uh, the situation there. But missing is Massport. We don't know what the hell they're doing. We really don't know. They haven't given us a clue. So we need to get them back into the dialogue somehow. Uh, if we have to chain them up and do it, do it. Uh, and all this space, by the way, is designated as the river walk segment, the upper river walk segment. It is not harbor walk. A lot of people get that confused. Now, it was part of the, um, the state plan 
to develop uh, as part of the harbor uh, park space. But that was not the walkway. It was just the, the distinction of the two. Uh, now, the Little Mystic Channel Lower River Walk segment, which is what we're talking about now, within phase two, is a much harder area to address as we have the designated port area zone, the DPA, which we need to change. It needs to change uh, from within the uh, southern side of um, the, the channel to the northern side on Terminal Street so that we do protect uh, the Massport property from any development there. I want to protect them, but I want to be able to leverage the channel space for really what it can be used for, and that is a park space, a water park space. We already have the Sprouts Garden. We have a dying boat launch because of water uh, elevation. We're never going to be able to leverage it again. It's dead for all practical purposes. We have a parking lot that's part of it, which is mostly vacant. And then on the other end of this uh, strip of land, we have the PDDA tenant, which is using part of it, what we call the annex. That is all city property, by the way. It is not part of Massport. It's mismarked in your literature. Uh, it's important to recognize the space uh, is, all of it is city or PDDA owned. Uh, and on the south side, we have the new town co-op buildings, which back up uh, along the channel. The two options, options offered so far for the channel space fail to address the flood risk fully and allow some areas with, without any protection at all. As an example, the, uh, the Sprouts Garden uh, will be salted up and ruined uh, because there is no protection there from uh, any salt water intrusion. Uh, there is also other buildings like the, uh, the Charlestown Commerce Center buildings, which will be damaged permanently probably from another flood. So these areas need to be protected and none of these efforts have been uh, uh, even talked about. Um, the other thing that we have to deal with is that the options that we've been seeing so far is filling in a good portion of the channel with fill, which we don't want. We want to leave it in its, nat in its current state of stone. We don't want any fillage in there. It needs to stay fully watered. And the deck uh, on top of it is really non is not really beneficial because the community that, uh, that backs up to it will now have peeping toms looking into their household. And besides that, these are north-facing windows in these buildings, so their light is already at a deficit coming into their windows, and, and they, the, there are only two sides, north and south, for their windows. So again, they lose all that light. So we can't have a, uh, a six foot or an eight foot uh, building structure in front of them like this. It doesn't make sense. Uh, there are other better solutions here. Uh, and, um, and, and we also, and as again, the high temperatures are the key issue here. We wanna hang on to that water space so that we can reduce uh, the heat island effect, as well as leverage it for cooling of people being uh, walking around it or within it, swimming or boating. Those are better things to do. So we need to save it. And the reason why this is so important, even more so, while it doesn't look like it now, we have 6,000 to 7,000 more people coming into this area with the Bark Hill Housing Project Redevelopment. So this, this is insanity to, to uh, block off futures. We need futures, we don't want to Cut, cut our uh, cord too short here, and we are. Now, the DPA zone uh, demarcation line, again, needs to shift to the other side of the channel space uh, of uh, the um, terminal street itself to, uh, so that we can leverage this space more effectively as a water uh, park. In a proper water park uh, protection uh, clause into the uh, into the city, char uh, city charter uh, would be important to do as well here, which is easily done. It's work, there's paperwork involved, but it can be done. Now, to, now the launch space, again, as I said, is not viable because of the Chelsea Street Bridge limits what can pass under it. Hopefully you have an email that I sent earlier which describes and shows you photographically why these are, this is uh, an issue uh, with some other data points. 
So what is the solution? How do we get everything we want and then some? Simply put, we need a berm and a dam solution and, and it is actually cheaper than what was been offered so far. So th this is really uh, crazy. I, I don't understand why we can't get there. Uh, so th the coastal resiliency and the hurricane rains has also not been dis uh, talked about. So we'll have a deluge of rain uh, for the Massport space specifically, and where does it go? Because if they put a berm around their property on the, on the riverside, then they could have a giant tub. So there has to be another solution here to get rid of that rainwater. It can't be pushed over the wall because there's water already there. You need to dump it somewhere. So the channel space can be a reserve space to put that, that torrential rain to store it temporarily. And that's just simply by putting the dam there. We drain it down a little bit. So now the drainage uh, of, the, of the deck space of Massport can drain into this space to protect the products that sit there. These are expensive cars. These are EVs that are being shipped. We don't want them all flooded out because once they're flooded, they're gone. They're, they're not salvageable. And that's an expense. So we need to, to, to do that for them as well. We also need to think about the, the um, Spalding Rehab Hospital there. They need to have some water uh, activities, which they desperately need to get people uh, back into shape. And they had, over when they were in the Charles River, they had a space, and it worked quite nice because they were a small contained space. But then when they moved into Charlestown, they only had the uh, front end of the channel space and then the, the, the river itself. And it was too choppy and too busy with traffic, big ship traffic, to be safe. So they, they really, it came to an end. So this space, if contained, would be a better place for them to, to utilize it. And we'd like to see that happen for not just them, but for us. So basically, the bottom line here is there is futures here if we do the right thing and don't cut the cord too, cord too short. And these two plans we currently have are too short. From what I understand from talking to people, the cost to do the right answer here is between 140 to 150 million to build. It is a smaller project. It does not deal with damaging the area where the building, the, the residential buildings are. It's on right on the, the uh, harbor side of the Chelsea Street Bridge. And it also protects the bridge because we don't want to replace that in 20 years, do we? because of being rotted out from all the seawater. All right, Dan, you got to land this plane now. Come on. Yep, I'm at the end. Uh, then let's push ourselves to get this done correctly. Please, we need a healthy symbiosis, symbiosis dealing with the climate protection as well as what gives us a future. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Uh, Rita Lara and then Maria Lyons and Sarah McCommon. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep it really brief. So my name is Rita Lara and I'm with Maverick Landing Community Services in East Boston. We're on a sliver of a peninsula that's been heavily gentrifying uh, since at least 2012, when I was able to get in and afford my unit. Um, and, you know, we've been involved in COVID response work, our organization the last few years, which includes a housing defense station with a number of partners, um, such as mutual aid and other partners. And what, what, you know, what we've seen, which some people have spoken to here is, you know, a family of seven in a single room, um, people trying to stay, just gripping onto whatever housing they have, um, it's really horrible. We have, we're on a sliver of a, of a peninsula with no affordable housing. I'm located right in the midst of a mixed income housing community. It's about 80% affordable, 400 units, 1,000 people. We need real affordable housing. Right now, our, our nonprofit um, and our housing development is completely surrounded by high-end luxury units, renting for $3,000 a pop per month, or selling for upwards of $2 million. Um, and you can't even see the waterfront from where our, our housing development is because it's, it's 
it's sort of designed and just so that it, that it's 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 kind of hidden away. Um, so there are a lot of issues, and so I'm just going to land on a few key points. We need to think about real affordable housing. Um, a healthy community includes people in the service industry. It includes people uh, who are teachers, people who can't afford $3,000 every month, um, families. That's what a healthy community looks like. Uh, we need to be very careful about when we release land from the DPA, we need a really thoughtful community process. It can't just be developed into business as usual. Uh, we have precious little land left. And I like to think, and of course, about utmost important, which a lot of people have talked about here, is really, um, really mitigating coastal flooding, um, mitigating you know, damage to the neighborhood. I think that can be done and we can build really affordable housing um, and stop the massive displacement that's going on in East Boston right now. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. And I believe our last uh, testimony tonight will be Maria Lyons from Dorchester. Maria, how are you? Uh, very good, Councillor Baker. Thank you for not forgetting me. Uh, it's been very interesting and, and um, I've enjoyed listening to everyone. Uh, every, so many people care about the waterfront, so, so that's comforting. Um, my name is Maria Lyons. I'm from the Port Norfolk, Neponset, Dorchester area. I serve as the environmental chairperson for uh, the Port Norfolk Civic Association. I'm also on the board of directors for the Neponset Greenway Council and the Neponset um, Watershed Association, and I'm the neighborhood representative on the Harbor Front Neighborhood Alliance. Uh, if people don't know the area, it was in dark blue in the picture with the rainbow tank to the south of the rainbow tank. Um, we have already experienced uh, significant flooding. We've had up to three feet of water on our streets and around Tinian Beach and the Ponset Circle. During those storms that were mentioned before, you could not get in and out of the entire area. Why does this happen? Because we have the compounded effects of um, sea level rise, storm surge, but we also have the flood water coming down the Neponset River from the entire Neponset watershed and off the hills of Dorchester coming down to the same location. So we have significant flooding. Um, however, we've had multiple development projects going on. Some have already completed, some are in progress, some are in planning or to be planned. Neponset Wharf, the Honda dealership, Freeport Tavern, Ramada Inn, Comfort Inn, floor and decor tile store, inappropriate digital billboard requests, and not to mention the biggie, Morrissey Boulevard itself. And all of these things are next to the Neponset River area of critical environmental concern, which is an important wildlife and recreational area. Now the city studies, uh, the Climate Ready Dorchester and the Boston Water and Sewer both say that uh, the flooding is going to get far worse in this area. So uh, I'm very worried that the current regulations about climate resiliency and development are not good enough for this area. We do not have a comprehensive plan for the area. It's all piecemeal. When we ask BPDA for a comprehensive plan, we were told we don't need one because we have good zoning. Yet the zoning for the area is being ignored by the BPDA and the ZBA. Much of our waterfront was taken by the train in Route 93 years ago. The zoning was put in place to protect what is left. The neighborhoods are being separated from the waterfront by walls of buildings. The actual environment is being changed. There's no respect for the ACEC or the neighborhood. Areas that we will need for climate resiliency. Someone talked about water retention areas. This is what we're going to need here. Are being built on. Where is the water going to go? Into the roads, onto the bike paths, onto neighbor's yards. And onto the train red line also goes through this area. Enjoyment of the recreation areas will be diminished by the encroachment of water and of the developments. And remember, Dorchester is also an environmental justice area, just as East Boston is. The Port Norfolk neighborhood, um, the Ponset area, needs city and state agencies to work together. It's the city, it's, it's DCR, it's MassDOT, it's multiple agencies to work together with the neighborhoods to make good comprehensive planning for the future. We seem to get forgotten. Please don't forget us. Thank you for letting me speak and for having this hearing. This issue is just so important for the entire city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. <clears throat> okay, um, and I'm, I'm not gonna read these into the record, but I just wanna 
state who is sending the public testimony. Harbor Keepers from East Boston has public testimony which will be available. Uh, Boston Waterfront Partners has testimony here. Um, Diane Valley from Charlestown has testimony here. Mutual Aid Eastie, Director Lisa Berry Engler has testimony here. And there's also testimony from a Rosemary A. Macero from 02129 is North End? Charlestown. Charlestown. Thank you. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over for Councilor Coletta so she can wrap this up into a package and we'll, we'll have the rest of the night to ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Baker, again, just for being available and doing this in the evening. Thank you all for still being here. It's a long night. It's almost 9 o'clock. I just want to thank everybody who showed up tonight, um, people who sent in public testimony. I mean, the response for this was overwhelming, and I just want to say thank you for your support in this endeavor. Um, I think everybody in this room understands that this is an all-hands-on-deck issue. Everyone understands the problem. Everybody understands the challenge. Um, we need complete buy-in and cooperation, both in energy and resources, from the federal government and the state. The city of Boston can't solve this problem on their own. Um, and so what I heard in terms of uh, consistent themes and, and next steps is that we do need more coordination and collaboration. We need strong public investment. Um, we need to move forward in this work with, through the lens of resiliency and equity. Um, I heard the need to break down barriers to implementation uh, through, through funding, more funding mechanisms, um, zoning mechanisms to incentivize resiliency strategies while also protecting affordable housing. As somebody who has almost been priced out of their neighborhood, that resonates deeply with me. Um, a thoughtful community process to oversee our precious land. Um, I heard the need for a waterfront czar, so we'll put an extra star on that and bold that. Um, and I look forward to working with the administration to pushing that agenda forward. Um, and obviously, always, always, always uh, centering it in community and making sure that we have meaningful community engagement in this process. So I just want to say thank you again to everybody, and thank you, Chair Baker. And thank you, Councillor Murphy, for staying the entire time. Appreciate thank you, it. Councilor Cutter. Councilor Murphy, do you have anything to say? Just thank you, Chair, for hosting this in the evening. I did see you know, the great turnout from the community, and thank you to central staff always for staying oh, late. Um, yes. I look forward to continuing the conversation, so thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, and I want to thank the council from East Boston for putting this in our radar here. I think it's something that can, something that will definitely benefit the entire city, even if we're outside of it. I have some waterfront myself, and Maria was one of my constituents talking about it there. So I appreciate it. Thank you, and for all the people that came out tonight and, and lend a helping hand, thank you. Thank you to the administration for coming out here tonight. and. Uh, Everybody have a good evening and this hearing is adjourned.